अगर पलक जग रही है इसका मतलब अच्छा नहीं था
they want they want to have kinetic energy but then there is an interaction which tries to localize them so there is almost almost always a competition between these itinerancy and localization okay which is you know deriving from quantum mechanics the wave particle duality okay so waves want to delocalize particles want to localize so it's basically derived from that so these are you know some of the characteristics of strongly correlated systems now these systems are not rare okay they are actually uh, uh, there are a huge number of strongly correlated systems. I am giving you a very small subset of those, right? So transition metal oxide, for example, high DC superconductors, uh, Mott, Hubbard, Heisenberg insulators, orthoferrites, for example, corrosive magnetoresistive oxides, and these are some of the materials. Okay? And what you should see here is that there is a copper here, okay? And there is manganese, there is titanium, there is vanadium. These are all the D and F electron systems. Okay? Mostly 3D. These are. Now, uh, rare earth intermetallics, which uh, give you heavy fermion systems. For example, you can have a rare earth like cerium, yetubium, plutonium, uranium, or samarium, and so on. So, these uh, are mixed with certain other metals, and you can get rare earth intermetallics, which give you heavy fermion behavior. Okay? Then, uh, you can have organic salts, which form, which give you kind of uh, 2D strongly correlated behavior. Don't ask me to pronounce them. And uh, two-dimensional electron gases, as, as Siddharth also pointed out, quantum Hall system, fractional quantum Hall effect is a uh, is a very classic strongly interacting system and uh, strongly correlated system. And uh, uh, the more recent uh, development of Moir lattices, where you take the graphene, which is a single layer system, and then put two graphenes and then twist this. Okay, so these are twisted bilayer graphene, twisted trilayer graphene systems, and now graphene has been modified to even tungsten disulfide or you know those molybdenum uh, sulfides and so on. So you can have those kinds of inorganic uh, bilayer or trilayer uh, systems where you can see uh, interactions to be emergent. Interactions are not present as such because graphene is well described by a one electron description. But when you put these two layers together, even then it is well described. But when you twist them, okay, that's when interactions are emergent. And the system becomes strongly correlated. It shows actually a lot of phases which are which are seen in uh, you know normal strongly correlated systems. All right. <clears throat> then there is a, a whole bunch of systems where the 4D, the 5D, you know, and 4F, 5F, these are all active. So these are the ruthenates, iridates, orthoferrites. So ruthenates would be where, for example, the copper would be replaced by the ruthenate. Uh, and iridium also uh, has a 5D okay? So uh, these are some of the, these are the very small subset, subset of materials which belong to this strongly correlated class, but you already get an idea that it is not a small class. Okay? There's a lot of, a lot of systems. And uh, these materials are interesting because they show a very wide variety of phenomena that are not seen in conventional uh, metal semiconductor systems. All right? So, for example, you can have a condo effect which is seen in dilute magnetic impurities in metals where, uh, as Siddharth was also mentioning, that you can get a global singlet ground state which is highly entangled and is a many body ground state. Okay? Then uh, you can have very spectacular metal insulated transitions driven by very small pressures, very small dopings. Okay? And uh, this happens, for example, in vanadium oxides, uh, lanthanum titanate and so on. So, uh, and Dipshik has already talked about cuprate oxide superconductivity and uh, maybe I will pass the phase, phase diagram and you can see there is a whole variety of very rich phases which appear as a function of doping, as a function of uh, magnetic field and so on. And uh, these phases, many of these phases have almost uh, uh, no consensus on their understanding. Okay? There, there, is, there are a lot of theories that are being proposed and Siddharth has also worked heavily on this system. But consensus has not been arrived at uh, these uh, in the, on the physics of these systems. Then colossal magnetoresistance is also demonstrated by uh, manganites, for example, where the resistance can change due to the application of magnetic field by hundreds of percent. Okay? Compare that to normal metals and semiconductors where it's just a few percent. <clears throat> then heavy electrons is uh, another example of uh, uh, adiabatic continuity where the low temperature physics of a heavy fermion system will be identical to that of normal metals or normal band insulators. Except that if you look at the effective mass of the electrons, right, then they will turn out to be you know, heavily renormalized, thousand times that of the bare electron mass. 
In fact, there are some systems which show quantum criticality where you can tune the effective mass to infinity. Okay? The effective mass actually even diverges. Right? So, uh, these are really electron systems. Then, uh, quantum critical points is again that which you had mentioned by the RH2 SI2, where you can have a, a change of ground states which goes through a quantum critical point and you, there is a quantum critical fan. And even though the quantum critical point is never accessible experimentally, even in principle, you cannot access it because it's zero temperature, right? Absolute zero. But it has a large influence on the finite temperature phase diagram. And that's very interesting. So it's, a, it's something that experimentists can actually never directly get, only infer it through a vanishing of the scales, right? But what happens at zero Kelvin? That is something that uh, you know, theorists can uh, actually look at through the models and I'll talk some, a little bit about that. So it also turns out that when string theorists went out of jobs, they started coming into con condensed matter and this was actually one entry point for them. Okay? <laughs> quantum critical points because there is a connection of uh, quantum critical points to black hole physics. Right. So then uh, fractional quantum Hall effect is again something where uh, uh, strong interactions play a very important role. Okay, so these are some of the phenomena and that's why the strongly correlated systems are very interesting. So I'll give you briefly, you know, the phase diagrams as we keep saying. This is uh, vanadium oxide. Okay, so uh, what you see here is temperature, this is pressure and this is uh, conductivity. Okay, and you see spectacular changes in conductivity as a function of pressure and temperature, right? Then uh, this is again showing the same thing for a single cut. This is uh, inverse temperature and this is log of the resistivity and what you see here is you know seven orders of magnitude change in the resistivity or conductivity okay so <clears throat> and the change is extremely sharp and people who make single crystals of these tell me that uh, this crystal actually cracks okay and these uh, transitions that you see here are quite complicated because what happens in these is not only a metal to insulated transition which is actually an electronic transition but you also get structural transition you also get a magnetic transition. The system goes from antiparamagnetic to paramagnetic and so on. And you also get an orbital ordering transition, all at the same point. Okay. So the question is, what is driving the transition? Are electrons driving the phonons? Are phonons driving the electrons? Are spins driving the electrons? What is happening here? Okay. So these are all uh, very open questions. right? The full picture is not there with us now. But it's not that it's only an academic uh, question. It turns out that this is uh, 2011 that I'm talking about. There was a, a, a paper in annual reviews of material science that was published and which talked about the ultra fast oxide metal insulator transition in vanadium oxide. And vanadium oxide has uh, this kind of a, a resistive transition which has to show the hysteresis. So you can see that there are a huge number of applications that have been envisaged for vanadium oxide. Okay? And in fact, some of them have already been realized also. One of the most important ones that we realized are as a memory square. Okay. For neuromorphic computing, you need mimics of neurons. Right? You need uh, analysis of neurons. And vanadium oxide has the resistive transition in vanadium oxide has been used to build neurons and uh, actually implemented in neuromorphic uh, chips okay. by IBM and other people. HP also. All right. So quantum critical points already has talked about by the RH2 SI2. And this is another material, cerium cobalt in M5. So what you see here is a magnetic field given quantum critical point and the, in the absence of magnetic field the system is a superconductor. The superconducting transition, the temperature goes on decreasing with an application of magnetic field and it becomes a uh, Fermi liquid. And what you see here is interesting because this is uh, the quadratic, uh, the T squared coefficient of the resistivity and what you see is that as with, uh, with, uh, coming closer to the quantum critical point, the A actually diverges. Okay, which is actually a signal of the effective mass of the electron diverging. So there was a paper by P. S. Coleman which said the electrons get heavier and heavier and basically they die. Okay. So at this point, the electrons are dead. Okay. Because their effective mass is almost infinity. But what happens after that is interesting. They have paired up and become superconductors. Okay. So freely moving. Right. So it's a very uh, interesting transition and uh, again, no full understanding of this whole thing. So this is why we are to it. You already Deep Chief has talked about it. Let me not uh, show you. But there are again many examples of quantum criticality now in this matter. All right. Right. So cuprate superconductors. Nobody has shown the phase diagram since morning. So I will flash that. Uh, I think I need to press this multiple times. 
Yeah, okay. So you see, this is the phase diagram, generic phase diagram of cuprates, uh, high temperature superconductors, and uh, these have uh, these kind of formula. This is cuprate. Okay, the cuprate is the important thing here, but these are also important, and let me not go into it. But basically, the phase diagram you see is a very interesting phase diagram. This is temperature, and this is doping. And as a function of doping, the antiferromagnetic antiferromagnet first dies. Then you get a very uh, surprising pseudo gap phase. Then there is a superconducting dome here. And there is a speculation that there is a quantum critical point sitting below this dome, okay, which nobody has been able to actually uncover. There are there have been some measurements using magnetic field where people are trying to suppress this transition temperature and try to uncover this quantum critical point, right? But uh, uh, it's not uh, yet fully. Uh, uh, there is no consensus on it. And above the superconducting dome, there is a strange metal case. And again, there is a lot of debate about this. And the reason there is a lot of debate is that if you see the resistivity of this particular strange metal, it turns out that you get a almost linear regime, you know, all the way up to 1000 Kelvin. Okay, so you see this almost linear regime. So this is 15% doping, which is almost like the peak, the optimal doping. And you see a very linear regime in resistivity. And what people have done is when they try to suppress the superconductivity here by applying magnetic field. The linear regime even goes down to t equal to zero. Okay, so that's a really surprising thing, right? Again, no understanding. So Siddharth told me that you know there would be a, a course would be even more interesting if you actually tell the audience what is unsolved. Okay, so you can see all, everything that I'm talking about now is actually almost fully unsolved. Okay, so uh, there is a lot of scope for young theorists, young experimenters. Understand? <coughs> All right, so manganites, uh, uh, I'll just tell you about the colossal magneto resistance, and this is resistivity versus temperature. So what you see here is that these are different fields, 0 tesla and 7 tesla, and this is a log scale, right? So you see the kind of resistance changes that happen as a function of magnetic field, and this is huge magneto resistance, right? Colossal magneto resistance. Again, not, uh, not a very good understanding. There are lots of theories. But uh, uh, still, debate is going on. And the thing is, a good understanding is important because if you want to make devices which are reliable, which are robust, then you need a good understanding, right? And people have not been able to utilize these CMR materials for devices because we don't have a good understanding. Okay, what tunes the CMR in these materials? We don't have a good understanding. All right. So uh, there's a lot of inhomogeneity that plays a role, and then ultrafold atomic systems are another playground. Where these are not materials, these are actually artificially engineered systems, but uh, you can take these uh, atoms down to uh, milli Kelvin, micro Kelvin, nano Kelvin temperatures, make both Einstein condensate sort of it, and then realize strong correlation in these systems just by tuning some parameters. Okay? You can have attractive interaction between uh, atoms, you can have repulsive interaction, and if the atoms are fermionic or bosonic, then you can realize those kinds of ideal theor theoretical models that theorists like to play with. Okay? So these are also called quantum emulators. Right? So here there is one example where uh, there is a collection of atoms which was taken from a Bose-Einstein condensate to a Watt insulator to a... Okay, this is uh, just another lens here. Right, so... <coughs> and fractional quantum Hall effect is another system. Let me not dwell into this. Okay, so now I am going to talk about uh, Theoretical investigations. So, given all this, you know, range of strongly correlated systems, you, you saw a very uh, nice range of behavior. Okay, very exotic behavior, which is not present in conventional metals and semiconductors. Right. So, what do you do to understand them theoretically? All right. So, to understand them theoretically, let's start with something that we that we all know. That if I want to understand any material, quantum mechanically, I need a Hamiltonian. And actually, we know the Hamiltonian. I was hoping that somebody will flash this, but no one did, so I'm doing that. Now, this is a grand Hamiltonian of condensed matter physics, and everything is present here. Okay, the ions are present, the kinetic energy of the electrons is present here, the interaction between ions, the interaction between electrons, and the interaction between electrons and ions. So these are 10 to the power 23 order terms, right? Absolutely, there is no hope to solve this, right? So we cannot solve this. But knowing the Hamiltonian, does it mean that we know everything that we need to know? It's, uh, the answer is no, we, we don't actually. So uh, uh, one of the answers to why we don't know everything about this was given by Siddharth. Basically, the 
Answer is emergence. When you put complex entities or when you put simple entities together and introduce interactions between them, what emerges is, uh, you know, there are different laws and different length scales and time scales that emerge when you put simple entities together and define interactions between them. Okay, so uh, classic classical examples of emergence include bird flocks, schools of fish, and so on. Okay, now even in condensed matter, when you put atoms together and they form crystals, they form metals and insulators. That's actually an example of emergence. Okay, so here what we have is electrons which are strongly interacting and the presence of other entities like phonons and so on. They give rise to very exotic phenomena. Okay, so this is emergence, right? So, in order to understand a condensed matter system, we don't need to always go back to this particular Grand Hamilton. What we can do is we can write simplified models. Okay, and that is the next thing. So, let me show you a very simple. Uh, okay, this is just uh, you know there are lots of examples of emergence in condensed matter. So, let me not dwell on that. Let me go to the simplest model of condensed matter that has been you know studied uh, extensively. Let me say there are maybe you know millions of papers on this model it's a it's a curious playground so this is uh, called a hubbard model and in its uh, in slightly more complicated form this term here represents the hopping of electrons okay this is written in a second quartile notation creation annihilation operator notation where what you see here is that the electron one electron is annihilated at site i with spin sigma and it is created on another side with uh, on other side J with spin sigma. Okay, so this is a hopping term, and by hopping, electrons I mean get their kinetic energy. Okay, so this here represents a kinetic energy term, and this here represents a potential energy term because this is actually uh, written in a form where there is a two-particle interaction between uh, electrons. Okay, and in its slightly more simpler form, it's written in this way. So what you see here is that electrons will only interact with each other when they are sitting on the same side. Okay. Normally you think of electrons as having a Coulomb repulsion, right? As a 1 by R. Okay. This is a very simplified version of that. They will interact only when they are sitting on the same side. Okay. You can see the kind of drastic simplifications I have made to write this model down. But do you know what? It can only be solved exactly in 1D. And just now I was talking to Siddharth. Even the exact solution has made certain assumptions about the dispersion of electrons. Okay, so you can see the scope you have. Okay, 2D is not solved, 3D is not solved, right? Even 1D exact is not solved. Okay, but it reveals we are talking about a very simple model, a Hubbard model, where there is a kinetic energy and a potential energy term, right? And the thing is, even though the model is very simple, the physics that comes out of this is actually extremely interesting. So I'll give you a simple example of this. So this is a, a very simple uh, method that uh, is present in the literature. And what you're seeing here is a density of states as a function of frequency. Okay. And what you see is that the spectral peak here at the chemical potential keeps on narrowing. Okay. And suddenly a gap opens up. Right. So this model here is able to actually show the metal insulated transition that we were talking about in vanadium oxide. Okay, it's an interaction driven metal insulated transition, right? But it turns out that the interaction at which the metal becomes insulator is actually different from the insul from the uh, transition where the insulator becomes the metal. Okay, so if you start decreasing the interaction, the insulator becomes a metal but at a different interaction strength, at a lower interaction strength, which means there is also a hysteresis. Okay? So this system is actually able to mimic a lot of the phenomenology of, uh, let's say, vanadium oxide. Okay? So uh, there is a lot of interesting physics hidden in these models, even though they are extremely simple. That's a message. But uh, uh, the Hubbard model is uh, one such example. Okay, but another, another uh, output of this model. So this is resistivity versus temperature. And what you're seeing here is nickel sulfide Se2 minus X SH. Okay, this is experiment. This is experiment from uh, long ago. Yeah. Sorry, I'm losing time by doing this. You need to give me five more minutes. I, I've been pressing this and it doesn't go forward. <laughs> okay. So uh, five minutes for what? Twenty-five, is it? Yeah. Then I should just jump to the last slide.
Uh, okay, so uh, this is experiment in 1998, and what you see is uh, good similarities. Okay, so the message is that even though the model is very simple, there is a lot of physics hidden in it. Okay, and uh, uh, even the 2D Hubbard model is supposed to represent the cube rates, for example. A multi-orbital Hubbard model is supposed to represent a lot of real material systems and so on. Okay, you see now it's not moving. See, actually, 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 it's not moving. All right, so there are, I'm just flashing all these models here, okay? And uh, each of these models is uh, written down to represent different different phenomena. Okay? If you want to study metal incident transitions, you study the Hubbard model. If you want to study the, for example, spin ordering, magnetic ordering, you study the Heisenberg model. Okay? If you want to study heavy fermion systems, you study something called a periodic Anderson model. So what I'm trying to say is that instead of studying the full grand Hamiltonian that I flashed earlier. You start looking at simpler models that describe simpler the uh, specific phenomena, okay, and then try to describe them. But even that exact description is not possible. So people make a lot of approximations. Okay, so I'm going to talk about how to solve these models. Okay, and what does solution actually mean? So I'm not even there at the half of this. <clears throat> yeah, I'll just do that. All right. So <clears throat> this is the periodic Anderson model, which is appropriate for the rare earth intermetallics that I talked about. Okay, so it actually shows heavy fermion behavior and we have used this uh, model to explain a lot of behavior in selenium hexaboride, cerium 343 and YBB12 for example. So a lot of rare earth intermetallics are actually explained by this very well. And this is the multi-orbital Hubbard model which is a generalization of the simple Hubbard model that I showed you and it is actually used heavily for understanding real material systems in combination with density functional theory that Tulika is going to talk about later. Okay? So those are, those are called DFT plus DMFT based approaches. Alright, so let me just skip all this. So these are the minimal models that I just uh, showed you. The single impurity Anderson model which is good for dilute magnetic impurities in metals. The Hubbard model for metal insulated transitions, cuprate superconductors, transition metal oxides, irritates, methylates, all kinds of systems. Okay? Periodic Anderson model for heavy fermions and so on. So, the question is, how do we solve these models? Right? What does solution actually mean? Hmm? So these are Hamiltonians. So given a Hamiltonian, what you would do normally in first level quantum mechanics is to basically find the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. But given this strongly correlated models, it turns out a wave function based approach is useless. Okay? You cannot solve these models as the way you did solve the Hamiltonians in first level quantum mechanics. So now if you cannot find the eigenfunctions and eigenvalues, what do you do next? Now what is experimentally, rele experimentally relevant is actually correlation functions. What you need are correlation functions, right? Because that's what you can measure, conductivity, susceptibility and so on, right? Now the question is, can you get these response functions without looking at, without getting eigenvalues and eigenfunctions? Okay, what do you think the answer is? Without getting eigenvalues and eigenfunctions, can we calculate correlation functions? It looks impossible, right? But it's actually possible. Okay, so the technique is called Green's functions based approaches. The Green's function is actually a correlation function of creation and evaluation operators. Okay, and it turns out that Green's function is actually an expectation value of these operators, and the expectation is taken with these eigenfunctions, with these eigenfunctions that are unknown. Okay, but without knowing the eigenfunctions and the eigenvalues, we can still find these correlation functions, and there are a lot of techniques for that. Okay. So those are all quantum anybody techniques and I'm just going to go to the last slide now. <clears throat> if anyone has any question then I can answer that. But basically what I'm saying is that using these Green's functions, if you can compute them, you can calculate density of states for example, you can calculate the, uh, uh, the electrical conductivity using the Kubo formula which is actually it turns out to be a two particle Green's function. So these Green's functions are actually very useful quantities. Uh, even dynamical susceptibility that has been talked about since morning. Okay? So you can calculate this using a two-particle Green's function. So a lot of response functions, including single-particle Green's functions and two-particle response quantities, can be computed using these Green's functions. So now, how do you solve them? Okay. So there are uh, analytical approaches. For example, beta Enzars is an analytical approach, and bosonization of CFT is also another analytical approach. But they work only for one-dimensional systems. Okay, so if you have a one-dimensional system like Dipshika is working on one, you can actually use these techniques to exactly solve them. Okay? And these are analytical approaches. 
but they are highly limited, right? So the other on the other end of the spectrum, you have brute force numerical methods. Like Sumiran introduced one of them, right? Quantum Monte Carlo. Okay. So these are uh, unbiased in their own way, in a numerically unbiased way, you can get the solution, but you are restricted by certain things. For example, the size of the system or uh, temperatures or interactions and so on. So exact diagonalization is one method and quantum Monte Carlo is the second method. This is the last type method. <coughs> Alright, so then there are renormalization group based approaches which work with uh, modifying the Hamiltonian. Okay. So it's a flow in Hamiltonian space that is uncovered by a renormalization group treatment and what you see from there is how does the Hamiltonian evolve say by integrating out certain states. Okay. For example, if you have a Hamiltonian which has both spin and charge degrees of freedom, if I want to integrate out the charge degrees of freedom and I want to see how does this model behave only in the spin subspace, right? I can do that using RG. Right? So there is a certain transformation that you can do which, rest, which you know integrates out certain parts of your Gilbert space and gives you an effective Hamiltonian in a reduced subspace. Okay? So <coughs> Schrieffer Hood transformation, poor man scaling is one kind. Numerical renormalization group that was developed by Wilson is another way, right? Functional renormalization group is a more evolved way. Then uh, flow equation method is uh, also called as continuous unitary transformations. You take your Hamiltonian and you keep on doing unitary transformations on it. Basically, what those continuous unitary transformations are supposed to do is that if you have a matrix which has lots of octagonal entries, it's basically going to remove all those octagonal entries and give you a completely diagonal form. If you can execute that all the way, but most of the time they break down. Then uh, density matrix renormalization group. So these are all you know existing methods, and the most recent method, and I believe one of the most powerful methods that has come up now and has been developed by Siddha is the unitary renormalization group. Okay, and uh, 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 I, I don't know whether we will be actually giving a talk covering this technique, but it's evolved to be one of the most powerful techniques. Okay, in RG. And then there are a host of approximate methods. Uh, there are something called conserving approximations, which are based on Feynman diagramma diagrammatic perturbation theory. So you do these diagrammatic perturbation expansions, and then you truncate at some order, and then try to evaluate self energies and Green's functions up to certain order. Okay? So there are certain uh, non-conserving approximations as well. And the puzzle is that many of these conserving approximations, uh, they actually do not reproduce physically observed phenomena. For example, mod transition is not uh, described by a conserving approximation. Okay. However, a non-conserving approximation like IPD actually describes it very well. Okay. So we don't understand why this happens. Even theoretically, we do not have an understanding of why an approximation which actually conserves certain laws like mass conservation, charge conservation, current conservation, and all of that does not reproduce physically observed phenomena. Okay. So it's surprising, but that's true. Alright, and then uh, variational wave function based uh, treatments, then variational Monte Carlo, and then the equation of motion, motion based approach, which again is a truncation based approach where you take the Green's function, you write an equation of motion for it, and then you do truncation after a certain order. Because if you start with a single particle Green's function, it turns out in the equation of motion, you get higher order Green's functions. And every higher order Green's function gives rise to even higher order Green's functions. So you have to truncate at some point and then involve a closure scheme. So these are approximate methods and then there are auxiliary particle based methods which are you know have politically incorrect names but it's uh, it's all right okay they, are, they go by the name of slave bosons slave rotors okay and so on and now they are added one more thing to this mix there is something called a rotationally invariant slave boson plus ghost method okay so ghosts have also been added to the mix right and then uh, these composite fermions part on these are all part of the auxiliary particle based approaches where what you do is you uh, you take a certain limit for example the interaction going to infinity limit and you say that all the w occupied sites do not form part of my hilbert space okay but to account for this uh, uh, reduction of the hilbert space you add in some more auxiliary auxiliary variables okay and these are called the slave bosons so these play with the hilbert space and then reduce it to a very simple theory and then solve the theory analytically. Right? Then these Hubbard operator based approaches also that Sriram Shastri and Hindi Ramakrishna and Nawal have been taking in the last few years. Then these uh, quantum clustering approaches which have evolved in the 1990s uh, also give a very powerful framework for solving many of these models. And actually most of the predictive modeling of strongly correlated systems 
is actually done using these quantum cluster approaches, which on one end of the spectrum uh, give you dynamical mean field theory when the cluster size is one. And if you go on increasing your cluster size, you can reach the thermodynamic theory. In almost the same way as Simran was saying, you, you take a very small system, but you see that the, uh, the thermodynamic limit is reached even by the time you reach 4 by 4 and 32 by 32 is basically the thermodynamic limit. So these are actually embedding theories where you take a cluster and you embed it in a certain medium and then you find the Green's function for that cluster. That cluster could be a size 1, which means it's dynamical mean field theory, but if you go on increasing the cluster size, you reach the thermodynamic limit. Okay, so uh, and then for a cluster solver, you need uh, certain methods, and the methods that I talked about earlier, which are these other methods, the RG method, the QMC methods, the diagrammatic perturbation theory based methods, all of these can then be brought into this quantum cluster framework to solve the effective cluster. So with that, I will stop because the next slide forms the starting point of the next talk. So okay, I'll stop here. And if you have questions. You can Yeah. Actually, I would think about that uh, skeletic effect. When, uh, when you increase U and decrease U, normally I would think of it as you fix U, you get an answer. Mm -hmm. So when you say you are increasing U and decrease yeah. U, what do you have in mind? So what we do there is actually you have to, see because these are dynamic entry theory, you have to have a certain starting point because it's a self-consistent theory. Now in a self-consistent theory, what is the starting point you start from? If you start in, the, in a coexistence region, if you start from the metallic solution, you end up with a metal, but you can also start from an insulating solution and you end up in an insulator. However, when you sweep the interaction strand, then what happens is you go on being an insulator, but at a certain point you switch to a metal. Right? But when you start from a metal, you switch to an insulator at a different interaction strand. So that's how you get it. And it's a it's a you can say it's an artifact of the self-consistency you know involved in this DMFT framework. And that is exactly what Siddharth is attacked in his latest paper. You know, he has found an impurity model which actually reproduces a lot of the phenomenology of the metal instrument transition seen within DMFT, but without the self consistency. So, that RT is still explained by that? Which one? The hysteresis and resistance that you were showing? Yeah, yeah, it's explained by that. Yeah. Right. Because, see, the thing is. Huh. Basically, it's related to the local moment state and the uh, Fermi liquid state being ground state and the excited states and low lying excited states and how they cross. So, they're flipping, is it? Yeah, their stability is flipping. So, one is an excited state, the other one is a ground state. And then that's why uh, Sumiran is asking, how is it that you know? I start from one side, I can get to this way, I can start from the other side. That's because in the many body spectrum, uh, these guys can flip their space. They are arranged. So it's an artifact of the method, but coming from the physics of the. Method. Yeah, it does seem to reproduce the physics. Yeah. Yes, there's the genuine physics. It's not a numerical artifact. Yeah. It's not an artifact. No, yeah. yeah. Really there, there's genuine physics. Yeah. yeah. By the way, Rajan is involved in that. <laughs> irrespective of whether you are increasing you or decreasing you, which way you are going. Uh -huh. No, but so when you do experiment here, right? Right. Your method of cooling and heating can. Absolutely. So temperature thing. Yeah. He's saying that even if I'm at zero temperature, yeah, so that change the you. You can do that by pressure, right? So if you do a pressure-driven transition, yeah. you still see stresses. V two O three, V O two, all of them show stresses. Yes. Uh, so you were uh, talking about the Hubble dynamical index. So you said that it has already been explored a lot. Uh, almost what I assume that in all in every study we will have those hopping terms and uh, the potential terms. Absolutely, about, right? absolutely. Yeah. So uh, there was one uh, coefficient t, which was this kinetic, which was representing the kinetic energy coefficient, yes. and uh, we also had u. Yes. Uh, now the thing is, how do you generally estimate those two things, those two coefficients? Yeah. So actually, uh, I showed you the simpler version of the Hubble model also and the multi-orbital version also, right? Now, the, it turns out that if you want to study a real material, for example, if you want to study lanthanum titanium, okay, what you would generally do for a predictive modeling of strongly correlated systems is that you would first do a density functional theory study of that, okay? And the density functional theory st uh, study of that material will give you the, uh, the hopping model, okay? Those T parameters 
they can be not only nearest neighbor they can also be next nearest neighbors and so on and the dft study actually takes into account the real material structure the orbital stru the electronic structure okay so it already brings in material specificity into the problem right now the interactions are estimated in another way you can either do something called a constrained lda calculations and there are constrained rpa calculations and so on which can be used to estimate the u the j and the other parameters so but they are they are always treated with suspicion what people finally do is they take the hopping model as derived from dft but treat the u and the j values as tuning parameters okay you get a ballpark figure by doing these constrained rpa calculations but then you tune them properly in order to see agreement with experiment so we for a particular so if we are doing a expect doing a doing an experiment over a particular material so for that material we have to do these study extensively to find those two parameters uh, yes because for all of them they can't be universal no actually it turns out that you can do a transfer for example if i am studying a titanate okay lanthanum titanate versus some other titanate if titanium is the active element i can use the u derived from lanthanum titanate and use that in another material so vanadium oxide for example i can use the same u that i got in vo2 as in v2o3 uh, will will it also depend on other constants like temperature and other other things which no, no, no. so in model hamiltonians they are not assumed to be dependent on temperature so what we are given is a hamiltonian right the hamiltonian has model parameters they are fixed they don't change either with pressure or with temperature and the reason is that you are doing a valence electron calculation if you were looking at for example if you are applying high pressures as in the recent high tc uh, hydrides okay those pressures are actually extremely high pressures what they do is they actually change the core of the material right in that sense if you try to model them using fixed t or fixed u and j you will fail miserably there you have to take into account the pressure dependence of these model parameters <coughs> Vanadium oxide is the classic example. There have been uh, at least you know, hundreds of papers written on whether it's a band transition or whether it's an interaction-driven transition. I have refereed both the schools of thought, okay, and I have recommended publication of, of both the schools of thought. <laughs> right but because both of them have been very convincing and i have tried to take an unbiased view i am seeing their calculations and they seem very honest and very thorough okay so as far as the current state of the art goes i just take one example to say that it is not sure in fact it is not even sure whether what is actually driving the transition okay whether it's a structure that is driving the electronic transition or whether it's the electronic transition that is driving the structural transition even that is not known People are trying to do that using ultrafast spectroscopy and so on, but there is no concern. VO2 or V2O3, because oxygen deficiency plays a big role in this transition. Yeah, yeah. So both VO2 uh, is what I was talking about. V2O3 has a very strong first order transition. See, VO2 you can get a very smooth right. hysteresis, right? V2O3 shows an extremely sharp transition. Mm -hmm. I mean, extremely sharp right. hysteresis, right? It's almost like a box like. Okay. But v VO2, if you see thin films especially, you see a very continuous transition. And actually, if you zoom into it, that continuity is not a real continuity. You will see lots of very minute steps. These are the avalanches, which have also been uh, utilized in uh, this neuromorphic computing business. Uh, sir, yeah. I, I got really confused here. Like you said, green function can solve majority of this. Oh, uh, okay, okay, no, 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 I didn't say that. Okay, uh, okay, tell me your question, then. Uh, that I... is what. Is. Well, if Green's function can deal all this, then why do you even go for this? Uh, Very good. Okay. Yeah. So one thing is, I told you that we cannot solve the full grand Hamiltonian. We cannot get the eigenfunctions, eigenvalues, right? So if we cannot get the eigenfunctions, eigenvalues, even of the simpler models that I talked about, then how do we solve that? Okay. So Green's functions methods are one way. to get the experimentally measurable correlation functions up okay that's the theorists way to uh, yeah, to calculate the correlation functions right but the green's functions also cannot be calculated exactly for most of these systems that is a statement okay so if you take a 2d hubbard model for example i cannot get the full green's function out the g of k comma omega i do not have an exact expression for it 
and even numerical calculations have been done which uh, are also you know have certain biases built into them like for example similarly when we talked about qmc right so uh, quantum monte carlo calculations are one numerical state of the art in the 2d hubble model context okay but when you get the green's function out you get the green's function on the imaginary frequency axis and you have to do an analytic continuation or a wick rotation onto the real frequency axis which is actually a mathematically imposed problem okay so yes green's functions do not give the answer i mean they are one way to compute correlation functions we can we can actually think is being overly pessimistic in the sense that no no i'm being realistic come on i do that no in the sense that you can use green's functions to make comparisons with experiments and a lot of progress has been made that way but i think what rabbit trying to say is that there's a lot more that can be done a lot of the times you end up doing perturbation theory what is called many body perturbation theory with green functions and in any time you bring perturbation theory whether the cdc is convergent or not can become a problem do you have divergences that start appearing if so how do you cure those divergences and so on and so forth so if you happen to come across a model hamiltonian where many body controlled many body perturbation theory works beautifully well done to you great publish become famous right So I mean, we have done this. We have actually solved for the green functions of the periodic Anderson model, and we have compared to, uh, for example, semi-gem hexaboride. It has a, a, a resistance change of uh, six orders of magnitude when you go from three uh, kelvin to three hundred kelvin. Right? We can explain all of that, and it turns out it is not just simple semiconducting behavior. It has a, a kind of something called a Hamann form, which is three pi squared by sixteen log squared t by t k, very non-trivial. all of that can be explained and using a one parameter scaling we can then go ahead and predict the optical conductivity the full sigma of omega comma t right and it turns out that you can get a very good comparison with experiments single parameter scaling so we have done this for many systems now i was showing you one for the n nickel to se 2 minus x and s right so there also it works so yeah yeah rajesh yeah. so this uh... dynamic susceptibility calculation that you were showing uh, how hard or easy they are to do as a function of field for instance ha huh. so as anil was also saying as an experiment in theory also they are extremely hard extremely hard uh, siddharth can have a different point of view because he uh, does that using uh, rg methods okay. but the conventional method of doing that is based on quantum monte carlo okay. and the state of the art there is continuous time quantum monte carlo what you get there is a uh, two particle correlation function from which you have to extract the vertex correction okay which is a beast and that vertex correction you have to then incorporate into the basis arbitrary equation to get the to get whatever susceptibility you want mm -hmm. and that you get on the imaginary frequency axis which is you know orders of magnitude more complicated than the single particle green function but that is the i mean you can take that as a pessimistic point of view but we have actually worked on it and we have been able to compute the two particle response functions using this and we have been able to get things like pairing susceptibility magnetic susceptibility charge susceptibility we have been able to get that so it is possible to do it i mean there are methods called maximum entropy method uh, and so on which are used for this analytic calculation but it's uh, tricky Uh, hello sir yeah you have mentioned that uh, state uh, auxiliary particle approach yes. uh, for solving the model hamiltonian yes. uh, like slave boson slave rota so my question is what is the advantage of slave rota method uh, over the mint theory very good <coughs> see for example suppose i take a condo model okay very simple single repeat anderson model where i have only one site which has interactions rest of the sites do not have interaction okay this is one site right so it seems like a very simple model to begin with okay but the solution of this model by ken wilson actually got him the nobel prize okay so it's not a trivial problem okay but it turns out that if you try to do mean field theory for it which is what phil anderson first did for this particular model he actually gave a wrong solution okay now what that means is mean field theories of the kind that anderson did unrestricted hartree fock theory will give you wrong answers okay however the slave theories have an advantage you can write a slave particle theory 
which has many particle correlations but you when you do a mean field decomposition of those many particle terms you end up with a mean field theory which is able to describe the ground state properly okay that's the biggest advantage of the slave particle theories that the mean field theory is able to give you almost the right ground state which a conventional mean field theories are not able to do. Uh, in fluctuation context is there any advantage yes yes so what people then do is since you are able to almost capture the ground state exactly very small fluctuations over that ground state will be able to give you good excitation spectrum that is the hope thank you yes. so one question so you uh, in the last slide you showed the classification uh, of various methods that you can uh, employ to depending on your problem. Some so uh, I'm I'm, uh, I'm curious as in uh, how for instance if I have a Hamiltonian to solve and I have electron correlations from the correlated system, so uh, how would I uh, pick up the best approach? For example, why would I choose variational method over a Monte Carlo method? Excellent question. Okay. One is, uh, uh, okay, I'll give you a sociology dependent answer first. <laughs> it depends on where you are trained. Okay, I was trained with Achar Krishnamurti in IIST, right? So, uh, and the, the thing is, uh, he was trained in RG with Ken Wilson, okay? But he didn't teach me RG, he taught me perturbation theory. So, I have stuck to perturbation theory over the years, but I also picked up Quantum Monte Carlo and a bit of RG and so on, okay? And what I'm trying to say is, Whatever weapons you have, you will try to use those weapons to attack the problem. Okay? Among the best of the weapons, you may say that okay, RG is a really good method. Okay? It gives you a lot of uh, insight into the problem. If you try to do brute force methods like quantum Monte Carlo or exact diagonalization, right? and if you are trying to do that, the advantage is they will be almost unbiased because there is no approximation going in. Right? But you are restricted in certain parameter regimes. Okay. So, what I was trying to tell you from that last slide is that there is no one single weapon that you can use to attack the problem. You almost always have to use a combination of methods and then arrive at the, a, a proper scenario for the problem. Okay. So, you apply one method, you get some picture out of it. Right? But then that picture will have caveats. Right? There will be approximations involved. There will be, oh, if this happens, then what? Right? You don't know the answer because your framework or your technique is restricted. So then you have to bring in other techniques. And one of the purposes of this workshop is, you know, tomorrow's brainstorming is to actually bring together the expertise of various theorists and experimenters. Essentially, all these methods offer complementary perspectives. So we hope. Looking at the elephant from different points. Well, thank you so much, sir. Yeah, Once again, thank you. for this wonderful talk. Let's thank the speaker. Once again. Professor C. S. Yadav, uh, he's from IT Mundi, and he's going to talk about uh, electronic transport and Hall effects in quantum mechanics. All right, so uh, good afternoon. Yeah. So I will be talking about some most general and simple experiments 
in punishment of physics or when we try to study the property of the material, the first measurement we do electrical resistance measurement. And which is being taught to the students in class 9, starting with the Ohm's law. So I will talk about the electronic transport in the material and the different Hall effects. We teach Hall effects to in a undergraduate level, and now in the study of the quantum material, different types of the Hall effects have come into the play, and they explain very fascinating physics of the material. So what I have planned is here just an uh, idea about electrical resistance and the ordinary Hall effect that we know of. Anomalous Hall effect, what is that anomalous Hall effect? Some material shows that Hall effect. Then the quantum Hall effect, that as many of you before I do know in the production electron gas system, quantum Hall effect comes up. And the recent time, this new Hall effect is coming up, is planar Hall effect. Right? So we have the field in the current direction of all in the one plane. Thermal Hall effect, which is a very recent uh, observation by a few of the groups. And then, if I get time, I'll touch upon the spin Hall effect, which has been into the discussion since last 15 20 years, but it has seen this. So, okay, let me start with electrical resistivity. So, we know materials based on the electrical property are classified as uh, insulators, semiconductor, or the metals. And if you look at the, the room temperature electrical resistivity, right? so this is a micro ohm centimeter for copper. And for graphite, we say mini ohm centimeter resistivity. And for diamond, we say this very high density. 10 is to power plus. And all the materials lie in this uh, category. But when we measure the property resistivity, we don't measure resistivity. We measure electrical resistance of the material. So typical way that we measure electrical resistance is this geometry. So we know we apply electrical field and then we measure the current. But the way that we measure is like this. Of this, yeah. So here, so we have this take this sample like this. We measure this in a constant current mode. So we apply constant current across these four leads outside, no, two leads outside, and we measure the voltage. And then the reason when to measure the constant current mode and constant voltage mode. But this is the most general expected, uh, accepted way where we take uh, this uh, this bar like this, typically from this bar, and this we measure the capacitor. And there's a lot of interesting things happens in between when the electron is moving through the materials. When we apply the electrical field across the electrons, these electron fields experience electrical force or in the presence of that field, they start moving to the other side. But when they are trying to do that, they come across with a lot of atoms and a lot of other electrons in between, and then they scatter with each other. So why are we scattering? So that effective uh, the motion from one end to another end is extricated by a lot. So if you look at this number. So then this is the speed of the electron with which they start moving. There is power 7 centimeter per second. But the actual drift velocity, this is 100 centimeter per second. So what happens in between, they have a lot of collision in the, uh, with the different atoms. And so they collide every 10 is power minus 14 seconds. So there are too many collisions. In this. So in one second, they are fully colliding for 10 to power 14, 14 times. And when we have a case of the extreme collision, extreme scattering, only in that situation we have the condition this Ohm's law is valid. And if the scatterings are less, then this behavior is not equal to the power, equal to, not equal to I at Ohm's law. So that's the one that we do, and so given in 1827. So most of the material that follow electrical resistivity uh, like this. Looking at the sum embodied material, so that's what we measure R, which is V divided by R, V divided by I, and the electrical resistivity we calculate R multiplied by A over I. If you look at the more semi classical description of this, we look at the electrical conductivity, it's the inverse of the electrical resistivity. It depends on the factors, the carrier concentration of the material, and this is the scattering time, and this is the mass of the electron. And here I have put up the uh, see all the graphs because when we study quantum material, we typically look at the temperature dependence of those material or their dependence of the resistivity with some other external parameter. So, like here, the metal that we saw, this is saturates at the very low temperature and these heats are increasing. As you go further high temperature, very, very high temperature, they will tend to saturate where the scattering will get to the maximum, all the thing. And so, in between, the reason. People say if it is happening, as Raza was telling for some qubit system, this linear behavior is seen up to the 1000 Kelvin. So that was a strange behavior. But if you look at the metal like iron, iron has a 
to the temperature of 750 uh, degree centigrade up to 750 it will start the such saturating in that case. Okay. And there the resistivity dependence is typically given by this in this small range. So rho naught plus k to the power n x to the power n. If you look at the material on the other side, semiconductor or insulators. So they can be explained very nicely with the rho equal to rho naught section. So there is a gap, semiconducting gap in that, and e over k b t that you can see. The difference between semiconductor and insulator is only the size of the gap. So from 30 point of view, they both are the same, both are the same. But the experiment is we put them in the two different categories. So look at these uh, resistivity of these materials can be easily explained by using a semi-classical treatment. We consider the electron as a ball and it is scattering with other atoms and other things and very nicely can be handled with the semi-classical treatment. But there are many other quantum materials where you cannot explain the resistivity behavior using the classical approach. So one of that we see here. So in some materials we see the condo effects. So they are metals typically having the high electron element. At low temperature, instead of saturating like this, this starts showing upward trend. So here, this load by the resistance, uh, electrical resistivity integral load temperature cannot be explained with this method. And uh, it, so two magnetic moments, they are interacting through the conduction electron. And to understand that, we need to go to the study of quantum mechanics to convert that. And this resistivity, the special terms comes up, logarithmic, some constant divided by T. So that's extra terms comes up. I have taken one more example of a standard superconductor where this uh, super, um, super uh, electrical resistivity of the superconductors drops to zero beyond a certain temperature, 40 less than you see. And this behavior we cannot explain. There is no way we can understand this semi classical manner. So I will put for the material, you cannot, exp you cannot explain their property using the semi classical way of treatment. People have started calling them quantum material. So my way of understanding is there. So, you, so like in the magnetism that we talk about, paramagnetism, diamagnetism, you can easily do the semi-classical semi treatment, you can explain that. But truly the magnetism is a quantum mechanical phenomenon. Right? So magnetism is always a quantum magnetism. But nowadays we again write quantum magnetism for everything else. So that's about the electronic transport that I'm talking. But let me come on to the next part, which is my Hall effects. So in fact, I know all of you are aware of this. We have, we have the sample and uh, we apply the magnetic field say perpendicular to this uh, and this is the direction of the current and when this is the case then because the Lorentz force there is a potential electrical potential will be developed across this and we measure this Vxy and we can simply write down a few equations of the voltage right, in terms of the electrical field and the thickness etc and we can write a simple expression that all voltage is equal to some constant times current into the system multiplied by the magnetic field and that's the thickness of the material. So that is how we do Hall effects and it's a very important thing because this Rx, this Hall constant, it is related with 1 over A and E. Right? So, it depends, so it gives you the carrier concentration. It's a clean material, if you want to know the how much the carrier concentration, you do the Hall measurement, you can find this end. You work with a single band picture, you can fit it, also you can do it with the electron hole into it. But for experiment point of view, we don't easily get this Vx. It's very difficult to measure the Vxy. So when we measure this Vxy, a lot of things happen. Like look, look at these four different voltages we have done. So when we are measuring a voltage across Vxy, what are the other things can happen? You can in fact measure the all voltage Vxy. In addition, if your samples, the contacts are not aligned, then you will have some longitudinal component. So that longitudinal component will be up here. Or in addition, what can you have? Since this sample is at a, is at a certain temperature, so there would be some thermal effects in the sample because of their internal Peltier effects. Right? So, so you will measure all this. So by taking different combination of I plus and D plus, I plus, D minus, I minus, D plus, I minus D minus, if you can do all that, you can get rid of all extra terms and you can get the Vx. And once you do that, all voltage, and this whole voltage, once you have that, and it will scale with the magnetic field like this, linearly it will go like that. That's our expression of the 
uh, whole body. So we do this measurement at different temperature to now find the carrier concentration. So look at this uh, graph. Yes, sir. Uh, I think this is the uh, I think so this much channel, 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 right? So this is a rho xy transverse electrical resistivity measure at different, different temperature. You see, and this goes up like this. With the magnetic field, rho xy is going down this, or you can say the RH is decreasing linearly. So this is electron type. And by knowing the slope of this, you can convert it to the n, and you can plot the n, like here. So this is, uh, this one is my n after, this one is n. So if you look at it from different temperatures, how my n changes, I can go to the So 10 is for 19 carriers per centimeter cube. You can do like this. And you can see how the carrier concentrations are changing in between. This is a typical measurement that we do. But this picture is so far simple. But we don't get just the Hall effect, ordinary Hall effect. There are many materials that show very anomalous behavior. So, like this sort of the behavior is called anomalous behavior. It's observed since a very long time. So, this is some data from a recent. So, this is some a compound called magnetic bile semi metal, MLTGAC. So, look at this. As I'm engaging the magnetic field, my rho xy is not going linear. It is having two different things. It is first going up, then becoming like that. And all this. Or you can again see the same graph in this. It is so it is not having one single slope of this. So this is typically seen in uh, a system like that you can have it here. So this row x y is having the two components. One is dependent proportional to x, and another component is proportional to the magnetization. So many of the systems which are magnetic or having paramagnetic component in them, they usually show this sort of behavior. And uh, so your real anomalous behavior comes up here. So this part is your real Hall effect, where the rho x y is linear with that, and this much component is coming because of the magnetization of the sample. That's what you see. And this is a bit very complex. Uh, the different way people have tried to explain explain this because when those system when the system is magnetic, you can have a spin up and spin down electron, and how they are interacting with the different atoms and the electron cloud. It can give you, so there are three different mechanisms people talk about. Side jump, where this electrons, one of the electron goes up. This is happening because of the impurity. So, like scattering of an opposite direction, if the electric field of impurity, like that one. The skew scattering, when the scattering is happening with the spin orbit coupling, like here for this impurity. And there's an intens intensive deflection. I mean, this is seen that the in inherent uh, intervent coherence induced by the axial electric field in the two bases. So this is all coming up with the new explanation for anomalous Hall effect, like here. So for, for now, okay, this much is fine classically when we do that, but all this sort of understanding can coming up because of quantum mechanical treatment of the material. So that's the anomalous Hall effect. There's another phenomenon I talk about, the quantum Hall effect, yeah. So there's no hysteresism. So, if you look at the quantum Hall effect, so typically this is observed in a system. I'm writing it as a two dimensional electron gas. So, means the electron gas, they have very less number of the carriers. So, electrons are effective, effectively not interacting, not seeing each other. So, behaving kind of a less gas. In a metal, we call them as liquid, so there is some kind of small interaction. So, this is electron gas. And when, have, when I say two dimension, this, your motion is restricted in the 2D plane only, one plane only. So when we do that, so in that two-dimensional case, rho xx, where the longitudinal resistivity and the rho xy, right, if you look at those, those both are having a unit of the ohms. Like here, you can see. Rho xy is same as the rho y x, the e y over j x, and then you can write this much. And for here also, instead of that area, you have only the width over the L. So both are having the unit of uh, ohm in, in, in this. So what happens in the quantum Hall effect, you might have seen these pictures. If you look at the uh, this quantity rho xy, so when you have value of the field is much smaller like here, you see quantum oscillations. As you go to the further higher field, but you see, you see the skipping, skipping uh, region where you don't have any value of the rho xx here. So you see only the peak up here. But if you go to the, look at this part, Transverse component of the electrical resistivity and try to see this so very much linear. So, xy is linear in the very low value of the field, but when the value of the field is higher, you see the quantization of xy. 
and this quantization is related with x over e squared. So like here, so rho x in rho y, this is rho x is a constant, but that's the to this magnetic field, and this is rho x y is like that. Rho, rho x y is proportional to the over any. So this, this is being taught in a books, many books like that. So in case of uh, two dimensional electron gas, if a field is sufficiently high, then here you can have a full circle these orbits, but uh, electrons at the edges, they will be like this. And you can study this physics using this uh, linear harmonic oscillators uh, picture, and then you can form this sort of different end orbitals. So at the edges of the sample, you see this sort of the potentials. So this is, say, this energy half, x plus omega, 3 x plus omega. So, but if you look at the only the edges part, this sort of, so one dimensional edge states, they carry the current in the cross V direction. So V cross V direction. You, you see the current in this direction, this, or this, or that direction. So this is a well defined and well explanation that we see in the books. And experimentally, look at the, this quantity in the conduct phase, which is the opposite of this quantum uh, physicist. This is given to E square over X. So these are the fundamental constant up here. And this value is 12.9 kilo ohm inverse. So that's a fundamental factor comes because of this uh, kind of counter kind of phase. All right, let me move on to the next part, which uh, recently people have started seeing in the uh, topological material. Yes. So to observe this quantum hall effect, yeah. so one has to subtract out the longitude part and the criteria? No, no. no. Why do you have to do it? So because this is seen only in the two-dimensional system, and where you have a very good control, you can make the contact just opposite to each other. Unless you have made it with a difference. So, because these are done only in the devices. So, devices were very much controlled. So, people don't need to do that. That's why. Yeah. That's why, yeah. So, that's your coming now. This is very much quantum intuitive of what we understand about the Hall effect. Because Hall effect, I said, when you have a current uh, flowing in your system in this direction, and the magnetic field is perpendicular to that. Then you have a Lorentz force and you get a potential across this. Now what is seen over here, you have a magnetic field in the same plane as that of the current. So there should not be any Lorentz force in this. Right? Even in that case, some of the material, they show the development of the voltage across this and one can measure this voltage. And that is called the plane of Hall effect. Yeah. And this is typically uh, altered with uh, some material called ferromagnet, not all, and some topological insulator and topological semi metals. This picture is this is seen. Uh, and uh, recently, there are a lot of reports here. The first 2017 people started talking about this. The one paper by Burko and then a group from India, Professor Tarabda and Simon Chukravi. They started doing that. But there are many different theories people have talked about why the origin of the Tenon Hall effect. But there are still some questions by the star. Okay. So uh, let me tell you something that seems to be under the topological semi metals. So, like here, so this is the end of a semi metal where you have this balance band and conduction band rising up, up here. And when you introduce a spin orbit coupling in them, you can get, get this sort of variation where you have nice gap up here. And here you have these two points that are smudging up here. So these are topological insulators. And here where I say these are the points matching at the two points. So there's a Dirac points, Dirac points at different this point. And like this picture, so you can have surface current and looking at the topological pictures, you can define this equal to zero, is equal to one, and then it can go to the wire point. So these topological metals, whether Dirac semi-metal or wire semi-metals, can go give rise to this sort of picture. So here you have a four-fold energy, and then you apply the magnetic field, you can go to this five semi-metal, this sort of energy. So drug semi-metal material in the presence of magnetic field can go to this much. So why this particular thing happens? If you this is again a picture of uh, those professional semi-metals. So these are the, some Dirac states, and uh, we have one event coming up here, and there is a kind of a polarity in the system. So when we apply the magnetic field. So your sum of the charge get transferred from one side to the other side. So there's a kind of a charge imbalance in the system. And that imbalance gives rise to that's our happening in the plane itself. 
so that imbalance give rise to the accumulation of charges up here and between these two points. So like here I say that in the larger magnetic mechanism when T is parallel to the charges pumped will be the wire nodes, right? From this node to that node, from this side to that node. So that's what uh, people have seen. And there are many factors uh, when we are measuring this rho x y up here. So there are many factors uh, that we do. So again here when this you are when you are doing it on a bulk material, so you can when by measuring rho x y you can have a planar hole component. You can have a longitudinal density component, and when the sample is not uniform, then you can have some thickness dependence component on this. So this is the rho x y we would be measuring, and out of these three components, this is the planar hole component, and that's the resistivity and other component. So we need to extract out our planar hole component uh, from the experimental data. So like here, this is the one picture after the extraction of the data. So this is on a compound called. Palladium dichloride, so this is a drug type 2 drug semi metal, and this is silver dome system. So, here this is planar holotype measured at 2.5 Kelvin, a different magnetic field, and this is the same thing at a fixed uh, field at a different temperatures. So, what you see, we see a periodicity in this value, and this periodicity where we can see the valley at 45 degree and the peak at 735, that sort of the thing we see. And as you go to the higher uh, magnetic field, the uh, higher magnetic field, then uh, this value keeps on increasing. The component of planar hall components keeps increasing. Or here you say, if you go to the lower temperature, then the value is higher. For low, for high temperature, the value increases. Like this, the thing is that you see. And this thing we say that uh, the reason for that is color anomaly or an isotopic orbital magnetization. This is all debated because when this which I started over the planar hall effect, people say it is happening because of the color anomaly. And color anomaly is linked to the presence of negative magnetic resistance. But now, there have been many systems which is observed that they have a positive magnetic resistance and they still they are showing planar hall effect. So people are still looking for more robust and explanation for planar hall effect. For any normal method, if there is no planar hall effect, you want this kind of angular dependence, right? If we do that, we won't see that. We will not see. Okay. Yeah. Or any other kind of thing. <clears throat> because recently we thought of trying the same thing on the compound called vanadium diacetylamide. We do not see that. Okay. Okay. So uh, with that, so that's uh, another Hall effect which I am talking recently. The people have uh, discussed. But here, this is not the electrical field gradient. Here, the gradient, which is a, the field which is driving, is because of the temperature. So there is a temperature field gradient in the system. So this is the thermal transport uh, uh, I am talking about. So like here, charge transport, you have electron and ions. Thermal transport again, you have instead of in addition to electron and ions, you can have phonons, magnons, and spinons. Density gradient here in charge transport, you can have a temperature gradient here. The electromagnetic field, you, only field you have is the gravitational one, so almost no effect of it. And here the degree of freedom are related to the charge. Here all these sort of the degree of freedom plays the role in the case of thermal effect. So now what, what happens up here? So you have this bar, say compound, and you have applied a temperature gradient. So this temperature is high and this temperature is low. So when you there is a temperature gradient, you will have a flow of the electrons from one end to another end. And you can measure their thermal conductivity. So but this thing is that if you measure the thermal conductivity along the uh, k in the direction of the plane, I call it as a k y y direction, or if you say direction perpendicular to the plane, I say k x y direction. So once you have this situation, you apply the magnetic field perpendicular to the flow of the gradient, flow of the charges. In that case, you start seeing a thermal conductivity on these two edges, and which is given by this expression k kappa x y equal to kappa y y. And this is uh, delta T by over the width, and this is delta T x over the length. That's it. So this is how they are, they are related. And this is I have written what my thermal conductivity kappa is. Amount of the heat current which is passing through that is kappa. This is proportional to the width temperature difference at the two end, and this is the area and that's uh, difference. So people have uh, discussed about this thermal hall effect. And there is a thermal hall effect of phonon and thermal hall effect of the magnet. 
like here, this is uh, for team of the system, and this is typically seen in the system which are insulating one. So, you, so in a thermal conductivity, when you are measuring, you don't see the electrical component of the thermal conductivity. You see all because of the phonons or moinons. So, like here, the so four, four plus eight different compounds. So, this is kappa xy plus kappa xx, and that's all the value that you are seeing. Okay, and there are some more uh, results. I mean, these are the two compounds that people talk about. Uh, for, this is phonon thermal hall effect. This is TB3 GFI 412, and this is their maintenance geometry. Here, it is on this side, this is the sink, and then you are measuring the delta T temperature which is up here. So, that's the delta. And again, you see uh, how difficult these measurements are. When you apply this magnetic field, the change in delta T is you see, 10 is to power minus 4 Kelvin. So you have accuracy less than of a milli Kelvin. So if you are measurement are that much size, then only then you will be able to able to see. There are only few groups that have started showing thermal wall effect uh, in some system. Yeah. So and again, this is the another compound where this is manual thermal wall effect. This is lithium and iron oxide. This is insulating for in a ferromagnet, and then you see as with respect to temperatures, this is the X Y. That's how it goes. And then in a many different directions. So these are the new results that are coming up. In future, maybe many people will be studying, focusing on this sort of the whole effects. Okay. Uh, I have uh, the one last one. Let me talk about spin hall effect. This the notion of the spin hall effect came much earlier, say around uh, 1984, 1971. These people introduced the concept of uh, dynamo and parallel. Uh, but it was discovered much later. Much later. They talked about the spin hall effect, but the actual discovery came up of an inverse spin hall effect. But here the picture is so if you have a material and there's some electrical, because of some electrical field, some current is flowing, electrical current is flowing, then you get the separation of the electrons of two different spins. So electron of one spin accumulate up here, electron of another spin accumulate up here. Or if you have a sum of this. Shape of the material, then is the flow of the current, and you will have a spin current flowing around. So, a spin current is generated with the application of a electrical field. So, you can control this spin current by using that. So, but this uh, people have now seen the uh, so the effect of uh, experimentally they have observed it. I mean, these people have been seven and they did it, and Hitz has very important paper on this spin all the time. So like here, if you look at this geometry, how they do it, again it's very complex, so like this system, there is a platinum up here, this is a PYA, some very soft ferromagnetic material, which is uh, used, which is being, which is magnetized, and which is used for pumping the spin electron, and they are introducing that effect in copper, and then you are measuring across the platinum. So that's, that's how we see. So the resistance in this small field region, in cases up here, or you can measure this Vn versus T, it goes like that. So, this is direct spin hall effect or inverse spin hall effect that people have shown up here. And this inverse spin hall effect, in fact, it's not discovered in 84, it was discovered much later. But this was the very first measurement where people talk about uh, having presence of some nanovolt, <coughs> nanovoltage in the presence of this magnetic field. So, that's small voltage that was measured. And uh, they use some optical method to find uh, this orientation of the electron on one side and on the other side. So these are the things that I wanted to talk about. So I will stop my talk. Thank you very much. So I thank you. I thank my students. These are four students who graduated, and a few more students. Yes, <coughs> So I can take some questions now. Uh, the thermal uh, effect, uh, so you said that uh, you were measuring here phonons. Uh, yeah. So can you go? Yeah. Phonon thermal effect, right? Yeah. So how do you separate uh, the effect of phonons in the thermal magnetic region than the electrons in the magnets? So the so point is, these all materials are the insulators, right? So this material is does not so any magnetic transitions or any magnetism in it. And since such a good insulator, so people don't talk about this kappa electronic part. So then people say this is the phononic part. And here on the other end, it's again an insulator, but
what is the magnetic condition and there are associated some other laser rays. Let's say those are the magnetic ones. But only thing is the important thing is the observation of this kappa x y across this plane in the presence of magnetic field. If there is no magnetic field, you don't see kappa x y. Any more questions? Oh. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, how many of these different Hall effects are related to some underlying topological invariance of the system, like the quantum Hall certainly is? Yes. How many of these other ones are known to show, for instance, some kind of a quantization phenomenon where you can you know, put your finger and say that quantization is happening because of some underlying topological invariance uh, property that the system has. So, I don't know about the quantization, but when we say anomalous Hall effect, mm. now then people look at these things in the case of the topological wild semi magnetic wild semi metals. And they say that you will get the anomalous behavior in the Hall effect and anomalous behavior in the Nernst effect when you have effect of the very curvature in those systems. Okay. So magnetic wild semi metals, they saw, uh, so means uh, anomalous Hall effect. Penon Hall effect is anyway topological. See, Penon Hall effect. This is all coming in the in this material. And in fact, in order to explain these, people evoke somewhere topological. Yeah, because but, uh, it's related to uh, yes. topology. I mean, uh, yeah, so this is, people talk about this, but I don't know more of the details, but they invoke uh, topological behavior. Let me rephrase the question. Yes. How many of these Hall effects are obviously due to some boundary effect, some surface effect? Some edge effect. How many of these are the currents that are flowing? Mm -hmm. And how many of these Hall effects? Is it clearly known that it is coming from some edge current flowing or a surface current flowing? So, if you look at this uh, observation, the planar Hall effect or in this thermal Hall effect, they have been done on the bulk sample, okay. right? So, bulk. How much the contribution from the bulk or from only from the edge okay. surface? It's a bit difficult to say right now. But quantum Hall effect is certainly seen in only most in two Because that would be another yes. way of, sort yeah, of right. judging. Yes. Yes. By the for example. Hmm? Yes. This one? Uh, this K increases as a function of temperature. So is there any magnetic transfer on that key? Right one, uh, right one. This one? Yeah. And then it decreases. Um, so this is insulating coordinate ferro magnet, and uh, I don't think this is a, uh, no, I have no idea, I don't I remember. Basically the magnetic transition is there, the magnet density of states is yeah. like there. Yeah, that's because I don't remember the ferro for... Any idea, what is the range of the phonons and magnons involved in this magnet? You mean, you mean the range? You mean the inner energy is the magnetic field no, no I, I don't remember. Let's follow the experiment. Let's try to do some common experiment to get some thickness of an amount. No, people have done. People have done the detailed measurement. Even neutron scattering measurement, the people have done. Yeah, on this system, they have measured. Sorry, Shaitan, yeah. I was yeah. not present in some part. So, did you also talk about topological superconductors? No, I did not. I want to ask if you have seen signatures of that somewhere. So, let me talk about experimental signatures of the same. So, in terms of topology, let me say something. So, this compound PDT2, which is a type 2 relax heavy metal, it superconducts below 1.7 Kelvin. So, you got above that. So, then we must get a copper PDT2. The TC increases to 2.5 Kelvin. Yes, and then uh, so other electronic property almost remain the same with the Brunner Hall effect. Mm. But when we did it for the silver, we did not see superconductivity down to 2 Kelvin. We did not see in this AG system. Mm. But copper system, we have seen up to 2.5. So this is typically same as the copper dope bismuth selenide. Mm. When we go to the silver, we don't see that. Is it understood? So, in fact, these materials are nowadays not called as a topological superconductors. The bismuth selenide of new copper. Yeah. So, these are superconductivity coming, not a topological one. Right? Topological one are the bismuth selenide, you do some SBS superconductor, then you see. Right? So, but what about the 
after the clinching experimental proof that they say that because of this it is topological but because of that it is not. Those, I think this is all the theory part, let's say. The clinching evidence experimentally, we don't see. Yeah. You, you have to identify yeah. some really non-trivial uh, topological defect in the system experimentally. Mm -hmm. Those are very hard to get. Even in quantum form, uh, it took so many years for people to see a anionic excitation, you know, in the short noise of the edge current. I mean, it was extremely non-trivial. So. People have been looking for Maya on us, for instance. Yes, yes. And we all know where that is going, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> so let's take a look at Hartmann Polytech. And uh, in Hartmann Polytech, you said the uh, whole signal is basically 0 0.1 millikelvin in, or so. In which one is it? Hartmann. 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 Yeah. So, uh, to measure uh, that temperature difference, uh, we need two thermometers, right? Yes. In, uh, yeah. So, what will be those thermometers? Did you have a look in the lower part of instrumentation? Of instrumentation, the because this normal sensor will not work like I think this is 0.5 kilometers. Yeah. 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 No, so when I say mostly the, if you are not using the magnetic field one, then people use the thermocouple, which is the this golden <laughs> chrome thermocouple, right? So there you can go to 0.1k. You, you can nicely measure the 0.1k difference. But in most of these cases, these are the resistance based thermometer, right? So this is a set of thermometer that people use. Yeah, so that can be done. Uh, uh, yeah, point so, one. point is for all this purpose, you don't uh, measure the absolute temperature, you measure the temperature gradient. Uh, With the temperature gradient, you can do you can it better. Yeah. So, like for my case, I made a setup for NAS effect and I measured delta T. This is, I measure delta D, not the T1 in G2. Yeah. So there I have this accuracy of even better than 0.5. So you have to have two points of contact and then there will be some amount of thermal resistance at the contact. Yeah, so that, that's a certain yeah. will come. It will, the contact has to be made through some metal. So you will have those, those certain losses. And sometimes the problem is we nowadays use CCR, right, to stabilize temperature. And the temperature stabilizes in the order of 0 0.1 Kelvin. <laughs> no. So, so, so I say this QD uh, system, they have this 5 mK. Right? Oh, okay. Right. So if you are in 10 mK, you are okay. 20 mK, you are better. Right, right. So we can. Now the mix is based on this end. Okay. 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 Thank you. Let's thank Dr. Yadav once again. Okay, next up we'll talk about the Kaushik side. He's from the Mumbai Delhi. And he'll be talking about spectroscopic investigation of conduction charge and spin diagrams. That's the wrong title. That's the wrong yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So after this talk, we'll gather downstairs uh, on the ground floor inside the PSP courtyard for a picture. So after this talk, we'll gather downstairs. After that, we'll have a PK. <laughs> okay, uh, uh, thanks, uh, if she can audience uh, to put up this nice uh, workshop so we can. Uh, discuss and we can learn each other's expertise. So today my task is to uh, basically show you what kind of potential the lab-based Raman spectrometer has. And I don't know whether Isaac Thiravandam has a Raman spectrometer. Low temperature is all no. Then you can not do anything that we'll be talking about. So that's your Okay. So basically, I will be teaching uh, more or less how to use Raman spectrometer to find out excitations in materials. For an example, probing magnons, probing charge carriers, electrons, and phonons we all do, right? Finding phonons in Raman spectrometer. Okay. Uh, so first, I will discuss about the instrumentation. This pointer is not working. Uh, yeah. 
So uh, yeah, so basically first uh, instrumentation of Raman scattering and which is a very easy uh, light based experiment, but we need to tweak those kind of instrumentation to find real Raman results. And uh, then several Raman scattering methods will be introduced, magnetic Raman, electronic Raman and vibrational Raman. And finally, I will be giving a few examples, the real examples that the experiments have done, we actually prove the what's right. Okay, so uh, let's call that way, like uh, Raman scattering is a photon in and photon out technique. And I will use Raman scattering as inelastic light scattering technique. Uh, like only use the uh, neutron as inelastic neutron scattering and mine is for the inelastic photon scattering. That's Okay, what kind of instrumentation? So basically simple helium neon laser that costs like 2 lakhs only. So this light will come, light will hit some kind of beam splitter or notch filter, it will come down to the sample. And of course the sample will interact with the photons. The sample has electrons, sample has phonons, uh, atoms, sample can have spins. Those are all interacting with the photons. And as a result, you will have scattered light, which will go. Now, when scattered light will go, there are two kinds of scattering. One is elastic scattering, and another one is inelastic scattering. And inelastic scattering means the red light will come, and the same red light will go. And that is very strongest, the strongest interaction or the scattering. This is called Rayleigh scattering. And the other scattering inelastic part is basically Raman. Now, you can see here uh, in the graph, so basically the Rayleigh scattering, when this is the energy scale, basically the difference between the frequency of the incoming photon and the outgoing photon. And when the energy change is zero, that means elastic scale power of the entire uh, inelastic process and basically will burn your detector. So we have to reduce this signal. So for that reason, we have a couple of filters. This is called notch filter, and these are the black filters here. Basically, this will kick out the red lights from the laser optics. Okay, and then finally, you will be recording the blue and the green part, the Raman scattering part. Okay. Uh, now, uh, in IIT Delhi, I plan for slightly different setup, which will use the kind of filters to kick out the elastic part, but there is little bit change in the incoming optics. For an example, the light will come, this is laser, light will come, and there is a light angle prism, and then, uh, of course, the light will be uh, refraction, going through refraction, and it will be on the sample, but at certain degree, at 30 degree incidence. But I will be detecting the light in perpendicular direction. Because scattering happens in 4 pi angle, everywhere it is happening. So it is perfectly alright if I pick up the signal right from top. But most part of the Rayleigh scattering will be the part of reflection. This reflection will go away and I can block it. And that's how I can reduce the elastic scattering more and more and can see the Raman scattering down to very, very low energy, down to 5 centimeter inverse, which is terahertz domain. So basically, by using visible laser, I will be probing dynamics in terahertz. So, uh, this is a very uh, famous Raman spectrum uh, taken on an underdoped cuplet compound. Underdoped cuplet compound, the doping is 0 0.07, still is, the, is an antiferromagnet. You do not have superconductivity. So what you see, this is energy of the of Raman ship. And this is a response function, the dynamic response function. Now you see the sharp peaks right here. Uh, these are nothing but the phonons coming from the atomic vibration. Relatively at high energy, you have a broad mode because it's an antiferromagnet. You excite magnons, and this magnon gives rise to these broad peaks. And in the bottom part of Raman spectrum, there is a weak but finite Raman scattering intensity that are coming from free electrons in the material. So if you do not have free electrons or metallic electrons, you will not have that background. The background will be zero. So it's probing the finite density of strings. Now, 
uh, the, there is a different name. If we flow the phonon, we call it vibrational Raman scattering for non magnetic. And when we probe electron continuum in metallic sample, we call it electronic Raman scattering. And to show you the energy domain here, this energy is nothing but the terahertz domain. So the so, so at this point, we are outside of the anti magnetic zone. We are very close to this, I and mean, it's almost like anti magnetic mean temperature is going down. No. But still, it will be anti magnetic yeah. You're not in the pseudo gap. We are yeah. not, not in the pseudo gap. Yeah. 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 So, so just in the border. Suppose I was properly in the main phase, shouldn't I expect the magnetic temperature to expand to zero? I mean, it's why it extends to zero because it is just probing the magnetic density of states. Density, yeah, it's very low, right? That's the same. That's the same. Oh. And the same argument goes for acoustic phonons. For acoustic phonons, uh, basically, we do experiment with visual laser, right? And the wave vector transfer is almost like a zero. So that's why we are not seeing the acoustic phone on the it's just uh, optical phones. And uh, this is a round scattering response function. Basically, you uh, probe uh, intensity, the number of scattered photons, right, per second or something, divided by the uh, Bose uh, factor. So basically, it is related to correlation function. And fluctuation, dissipation, uh, yeah, theory. It's, uh, yeah, exactly. Well, I mean, also exactly the same thing. Yeah. For you, it's structure factor. It's structure factor. For you, spin spin correlation. Here depends on the experiment. Like electron density correlation function can be spin spin correlation function. Yeah. The dynamic test. Magnetic spectrum. You will get there something like one forty. Yeah, uh, divided by eight. Yeah. So. So, uh, no, why 1.8J? You mean the two magnon, that's why you are just multiplying and then that one from kind of factor to 1.8J. But I don't know what is the J in the cuprate. Uh, yeah. yeah. Then convert it with electron force and then. Very yeah. So uh, th this is the point. This is magnetic density. So there are many. It's a it's a big, very big. But with the vertex factor and everything, this is what you see at the end of the day. Okay, part of the magnet. If you do spin wave calculation by taking care of this J and the spin alignment, you will get a broad uh, magnetic spectrum, and it will be this will be part or the center point. There is no Q because here two magnum, right? So we are uh, exciting magnum with plus Q and magnum with minus Q that cancel out. Zone boundary magnums. You can probe zone center magnum only if you have finite gap at the zone center. When you have spin orbit coupling, you have magnetic crystal and an isotropic gap, then you I will come to that. But yeah. Dunua sector, can you measure the zone center? If it was not Raman, but Dunua sector, can you measure this? A uh, bigger center with a visible laser to magnum? No, it's not possible. But if you have spin orbit coupling in your material, for an example, strong center root net, then you can measure right? one max. Okay. So, uh, phonon is very trivial, right? Uh, because atoms are not static. But they are vibrating because of finite temperature. Every electronic state will be splitted into many vibrational states. And uh, for an example, this H cap omega P to H cap omega P, these are the phononic excitation states. And uh, the main scattering mechanism is the Rayleigh scattering. The electron will be excited to some virtual state and come back exactly at the same level, and you get huge scattering. But for the stroke, it will uh, start from the ground step and then go to the next excited step because of phono. And you will get some peak. And for anti stroke photon, it's exactly the electron will be sitting in the excited step, then come down. And this is 
uh, intensity is less because of Maxwell Boltzmann statistics. Simply by taking the ratio between these two intensity, I can tell what is the temperature, effective temperature after shooting the laser on my sample. That's the advantage you have. Exactly. Like heating up. You no. are always heat up the sample because you have uh, the laser with finite power and the objective is 100x. That means a lot of photons in a tiny spot. Okay. Uh, now I come to these two magnon scattering. Uh, for an example, uh, just consider antiferromagnetic spin chain, one dimension. The light comes in. Light will interact with one of the electrons. And now, after interacting, this electron will try to uh, minimize its energy. So it will hop to the next neighbor. So uh, at the intermediate state, you have the double occupancy. And of course, uh, because of Coulomb interaction on site, it is not energetically favorable state. So the, the electron which was sitting here, they can go the other state, right? Now, if you look at the initial and final state, locally you will see that the two spin splits, right? At, at, actually, it's not flip, but they alternate their side. And they alternate because overall, you don't change the spin state because light has no spin, right? It's linearly polarized light, no angular momentum, nothing. So total spin, if you add up, it's just exactly the same. So now we know that if you apply simply Heisenberg exchange interaction, you know the energy difference between the initial and final state, right? And it will be, uh, for an example, this is the final state, J squared, and this is the initial state, minus 3J squared. And the difference will be 4J squared, and for S equal to half spin state, it will be simply the J, energy difference is J. So in principle, if you find this artificial system, if you do down scattering, you will get a peak at, our, at the value of J. So that is basically by doing Raman scattering, by probing the magnum, the central magnum peak, you can find out the uh, information about the exchange interaction, J. Isn't, isn't it not generation of some kind of a boundary, the aromatic exomaline boundary. Like, you well, these are, no, these are the, the line that you have arranged in which there are ups and uh, separated <laughs> by a range which is downs. That's like generation of a domain boundary, you know, and the, because I thought... You were just considering just one proton is coming, interacting with one electron. No, so it, finally it stays like this or... It no, it is intermediate. This is meta so the final one. No, final one, of course, means it is an excited state, right? right. It will decay. So in time, it in is time, going to go back to the initial Exactly. So that, that is the, the that is how you get the line width, basically. It will decay. So now uh, the one question is can we see this kind of scattering for a ferromagnet? The answer will be no, because look at the intermediate state. In the intermediate state, you will, at one point you will have double occupancy. And because in ferromagnet, it will be double occupancy of two exactly same aligned spin. And Pauli's exclusion principle doesn't support that. That's why you will not have. Okay. In reality, uh, of course, you do not have this kind of linear spin chain. You will have much more complicated, and there are several J, and the spins are aligned in different direction. And you have to use kind of uh, Powering out in a slight scattering operator, taking care of how the J exchange interaction looks like and what is the incoming polarization of the light. And by doing all this, you will get to know the magnon density of states. Okay. Uh, now I come to the non trivial part the electronic Raman scattering. Uh, think about a metal. The metal has three electrons, and the three electrons will. Uh, basically crowd around the positive ion core, okay? Now, uh, light has electric field, and when the electric field will come, this electron cloud will be displaced, like momentarily. It will dip, and it will not stay there forever, and it will try to go back, because positive ion core will try to pull it back. And as a process, the electron cloud, when it relax and goes back to original state, it will interact with the surrounding electrons. And while interacting with the surrounding electrons, it will find out the relaxation time. 
of the charge carriers. The true day relaxation time of the charge carriers are zero frequency, the static. And also, if you switch on the correlations, the interaction will be higher and higher. So that's how you will find out what would be the effective mass as well, like effective mass enhanced due to correlations. You can find out. And this, all the method I will be talking about tomorrow, how to do that. But today I will give you just a few examples. Okay. Let's talk about phonon. Uh, this is one material intermittently compound, chromium arsenic. This is an antiferromagnetic metal. You talked about, uh, Raja talked about some uh, phase transition, structural plus magnetic transition at the same temperature. And this is exactly the example. At 265 Kelvin, this becomes an antiferromagnet. And whole crystal volume expands by 2%. At the same transition temperature and the symmetry doesn't change. The space group, every symmetry is intact. Only the axis changed. And the crystal volume change is so large that you start with a single crystal, you pull down, you will have multiple pieces of single crystal there. Yes. It breaks. Yeah. And so for that reason, resistance versus temperature measurement is extremely difficult because you will have broken circuit at, yeah, at low temperature. Okay. Now what will happen to the phonon if you have this structural transition? And you have also magnetic transition, right? So uh, we studied this compound, uh, as you see here, we studied the phonon, right? Uh, this, there are a couple of phonons comes from the symmetry relationship. There are, right? there, are. there are, there are, yeah. That's why it's not completely zero. Zero is somewhere in the bottom axis and it's finite. So what is the signature of resistance? Uh, resistance, it's an, it's an ferromagnetic semi-metal. So resistance goes down, but it's linear resistance. That means linear resistance versus temperature is linear at high temperature. But at very low temperature, it is uh, Fermi liquid like. At the transition, what is the change? Uh, it, is, it is extremely linear above the transition, but below the transition is started to cover. Yeah. Yeah. So there are Fermi surface reconstruction happening, of course, because of volume change. Yeah. Okay, so uh, symmetry relationship or uh, group theory calculation says that there are four phonons possible and we exactly got four phonons. But uh, for today's discussion, we'll be focusing on the very bright phonon here. Means how it responds to the structural change or the magnetic, magnetic transition. And then finally, I will be talking about these extra modes. So black represents the low temperature data, the extra modes that comes up. And that is related to magnon scattering. Okay, first the phonon. Uh, what I plotted the phonon as a function of phonon energy as a function of temperature. So if you pull down, the phonon energy goes up. This is normal because atom you pull down, the whole lattice gets contracted, atom to atom distances gets closer and closer. So you have larger overlap. That's why phonon energy increases. The moment you have the structural transition, the whole crystal volume expands. So atom to atom distance now it increased. So spin constant decreases. And that's why there is a huge drop of 12%. Now think about this. There is 2% change in the volume. And that gives you 12% change in the uh, phonon frequency. And that's how you can find out the Gronison parameter for the particular phonon. Okay, so this is a mode softening. It's a it's a softening. Yeah, exactly. Uh, otherwise, it just follows. It gets hardening again because right. you have already reached you already reached the transition. Okay. Okay. Now I will look at the line width. The line width basically represents the inverse of light time. Okay. Usually, what I expect for the line width. Line width should always decrease when you pull down. Because phonon, line width means phonon is interacting with other phonon. Right? Phonon phonon interaction will go up and up when you increase the temperature because phonon is boson. The density of phonon increases with temperature. So at high temperature, we have larger density of phonon. That means larger phonon phonon scattering. So light time will go down. So line width goes up, inverse relation. And, but here, what you see, when you pull down, line width actually increases. 
as soon as you reach this uh, low temperature phase, it increases and then finally decreases it. So there are two effects. One is this normal decrement of the phonal language is because you are pulling down, you are having less and less phono. Okay, that is one. Why it goes up here? Because phonon now sees the magnetic channel or spins, active spins. So phonon can decay through magma or the spin channel. And that's why the line width of the phonon increases here. And yeah. Oh, really? <laughs> okay. Okay, I will take this. This is pink phonon coupling. This is line shape. Uh, this why it's come here, right? Line shape. Oh there can be phenol like asymmetric line shape, but there may not be. In, uh, in most cases, you have phenol like line shape. Yeah. Okay. So uh, this is basically this uh, this peak comes from this competition between two effects, phonon phonon scattering and phonon spin scattering. Okay. Uh, now uh, I will look at these uh, two magnums, means in Raman scattering, you let's say as a function of temperature, you see something that is evolving. But how can you uh, identify that there is a magnum scattering? The one way is to do real temperature dependence. Like you do temperature dependence and you see that this particular mode is coming up more and more towards low temperature. You just take the area under this curve and plot as a function of temperature. That is exactly the red line size. And now I plot the magnetic susceptibility data on top of each other. They just follow. So, so what is coming in the parallel geometry? Even the it's parallel geometry. I know that, that doesn't matter. It depends on the Harvard kind of symmetry you have, or what is the crystal structure. Yeah. Okay, so that's way that's one way to identify that the mode that is coming up is actually a magnetic mode or magnetic Okay. Now uh, fractionalized excitations, okay. Marana or whatever. So uh, this is a, a CO2 IRO3 2D Kikai kind of second generation uh, honeycomb magnet. And the study led by our PSA, uh, Ajay Shud. So we trust the data. When he does Raman scattering, we trust. Okay. So basically, what uh, has been found out, found out that at the bottom, huh? no, no, I mean, I just said it's credit, it's credit, really. <laughs> Means I am blind on that. <laughs> okay, uh, so basically, uh, these are the different three temperatures, and at the bottom, you can see there is kind of finite round scattering, just finite. It's an insulator, of course, but still, you have some kind of finite round scattering background. So, that's like your electronic. It, in principle, it is it's not electronic because there is no density of states. Fermi surface has gap, right? Yeah, coming. Yeah. So <laughs> yeah. So still you have this finite intensity, means from where it comes. It cannot be phonon, of course. Phonon gives rise to by brighter peak like this M1, M2, M3. And it's not electron either because there is no density of state. It is a huge gap in between. Uh, the black, uh, yeah, this M1 empty is fine, but the black and things, I just maybe different channel or something. Could be, means I just forgot. Means, uh, what are these? Okay, oh, okay, I, I see the point now. So, black is nothing but so you can see here red line, right. To me, it looks like they subtracted this elastic contribution. Okay, basically long tail they subtracted, so this is more down, and this is almost similar, right? Long tail is coming from Rayleigh scattering. Lorenzian peak will be there around zero centimeter inverse, and you just subtract the Lorenzian tail. You have to because Rayleigh scattering is there. Now still there is a finite contribution, and now if it is phononic background or magnonic background, it should follow both statistics. But if it is fermionic excitation, it should follow Fermi Dirac statistics. So to find out that, we have to basically take the area 
and then plot as a function of temperature how it changes. Okay. And they found out basically the inset that it is going down and then going up again. For bosonic contribution, the red line will show. So it will go like this for bosons. But somehow it's following like that, but below around 125 or even 150 Kelvin, there is after. So if you just subtract this bosonic contribution, and you see there is a, this black symbols here, and this is you can this you can explain in terms of two fermion. One take one fermion, another fermion. If there is a fermion fermion scattering, uh, basically one by x square uh, term, that can explain well. And the conclusion is this continuum is coming from two fermions. There is a fermion, fermion scattering is happening. Now, how can you find out fermion in an insulator? So, one way to explain this, there are fractional excitations, and these fractional excitations in 2D detailed model, it is Majorana fermion. But I cannot really say these are Majorana fermion, this can be spinos as well, right? But a topology uh, or the Raman signature of Majorana fermions, I, mean, uh, I don't know, and there is no paper yet. And we have to find out. Okay. So, the, so the area under the curve is being integrated from each. Yeah. Which is what we are showing as these squares. What exactly is it representing the area under the curve? Area under the, the curve, curve, basically, if you, it's a density. Basically, if you have, so this area gives you the Raman intensity, right? Raman intensity comes from interaction. So finally, what you are measuring are correlations then? It's a correlation. But the correlation is not a fixed amount of uh, particle that you have. This number density of the particle is changing as a function of temperature. Isn't it? Look at the phonons, right? Number of phonons changes. It's not only correlation, it's weighted. Usually, you do uh, measure correlations. In normal case, if you just uh, divide by these both factors, then you can say we are just proving the correlations. The thermal factor you just neglect. What is this shaded area? So, top graph, I see this is crossing over the graph, right? Okay. This shaded area, this is blue. Yeah, this is the continuum, basically. So, in principle, this will be zero. The background. But it's not background, there is a finite background. So, the little mm. peak around 250 is genuine? Uh, little peak around 250. Yeah, yeah. Here, here. Here, no, I mean. These are kind of look, this point error can come are. down. These are error bars. In, yeah. Means there are error bars actually, it will be bigger even. Means in Raman's scattering, if you do error calculation nicely. So, what should we take away from here as you come down from 295 to 6? What am I supposed to take away? Okay. Here? So basically, if the contribution is phononic or the bosonic, what do you expect for 6 Kelvin? Nothing, no contribution is there, True. but the, the fact that you're still getting very still strong, getting very strong exactly, exactly. That's the signature. That is the harmony. Yeah. So that is the signature. That's so it. basically, in an earlier plot, Raja asked you that the R, in the y-axis was R into chi double prime. Now the R is not the Bose, thermal Bose factor. It's something else. Here I plotted only intensity because I don't. So there I plotted the R chi double prime because I know that there is only thermal Bose factors are there. Right. But in this material, if you want to be very specific and want to find out something, I just plot the intensity and find out whether it is really bosonic or fermionic. Okay. Good practice is you just plot the intensity, take the area. If it follows both statistics, then divide by the Bose factor. If it doesn't follow the Bose statistic, don't divide. Find out what statistics it is. And that's how we find so out. it's something into chi double prime. Yeah, something into chi double prime. Exactly. The question directly would be, can we find the Fisher measure for Besides the quantum Fisher uh, information, which uh, this one, which Anil Jain talked about. So can we link this purple? The area? reason I asked this question was because that is the integral under the curve. Yeah. And uh, because it is. It's only vertical transition, everything, yeah.
Yeah. There, there is no cube difference or anything. Yeah. That's why I was confused. What is this? Yeah. Is it? Nevertheless, I think the takeaway is sorry. And but nevertheless, I think the, the big takeaway from here is that even though you come down from pretty large temperatures to truly quantum temperatures, right. the fact that, that uh, the, these curves haven't sort of come down is telling you that there are strong quantum fluctuations in the system that are most likely not both. Not both. Yeah, exactly. That, that's, that's the, that's the, that's the, the takeaway take take from the it, it, it is what we It's not boson. <laughs> you so can explain it with fermionic nature, right. but that's yeah, right. not possible. Yeah. It's not a smoking gun experiment for right. fermionic. Okay, so uh, yeah. usually fermion fermion interaction should have something like f into one minus. So here it's uh, this this particular term here. This uh, there are uh, yeah there are different ways to explain. So this particular term one minus a square. It comes from creation of fermion pairs through creation and analyzation. So that's how this uh, interaction comes out. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I didn't reach the electronic Raman part. Uh, maybe I'll just flash through this part only. Uh, for an example, uh, let's say we have a semiconductor and we dope the semiconductor with few charge carriers, the doping. So the semiconductor behaves like a metal. And you know Fermi, Fermi velocity, right? The highest velocity of one electron. And you can find out from band structure. From electronic Raman experiment, I can also find out the Fermi velocity of the electrons. So how? For an example, uh, these are the different temperature uh, data. So 300 to 5 Kelvin. And now you see. In this region, the very low energy region, that's how the low energy is very important to find out electronic information or continuum scattering. Low energy is important. So if you pull down, what you see, this particular broad peak becomes sharp and sharp. This is because the Fermi surface gets sharper and sharper at low temperature. Okay. Now this cutoff energy, so this goes up and then comes down around 100. So this cutoff energy is related to the Fermi velocity. Okay, let's calculate the Fermi velocity from this graph. So this QVA, VF is the Fermi velocity and Q is the momentum transfer. You, you use some laser with the laser, uh, you transfer some momentum to the electrons. And the tau is the relaxation time of those charge failures. Okay, now tau is, H cut over H cut omega cut off, H cut omega cut off is about 100 centimeter inverse. You can convert it to electron volt, and H cut also you can convert into electron volt per, per time setting. And what you get at the end, the relaxation time, the Rude relaxation time, you can find out. Okay, so now I have tau, I just need to find out Q. The experiment uh, the authors did with 1064 nanometer laser, that means NDR laser, the first third one. So I know already uh, the lambda, 1064, so I can find out Q. So Q now I can put in tau, I can put in, and if I find out the Fermi velocity, it is about 10 to the power 6 meter per second. You can find out Fermi velocity within Raman. And since Raman can probe the Fermi surface, we can also find out the superconducting gap coming from the Fermi surface. We can actually measure the gap, uh, the magnitude of the gap. So for an example here, uh, in a superconductor, we know the gap only opens in the antinodal region. That's why in the antinodal region, there is a huge spectral change, weight change. Uh, but in the nodal region, there is hardly any change between the two temperatures, right? Above the transition and in the superconducting transition, uh, below, much below the superconducting. So uh, it's uh, in uh, electronic Raman scattering. Uh, mm -hmm. Basically, the vortex, the Raman scattering vortex, is a function of incoming and outgoing polarization. So if you do it incoming and outgoing polarization, you can have Raman structure factor finite in the blue, green region, and if you do cross polarization, you will have finite Raman structure factor only in the antinodal region. That's how you can distinguish different areas of the blue or the fine surface. That's kind of selection rule you have. 
and since in the nodal region you do not have any gap opening so at low and high temperature there is hardly any change but you have large gap opening in the nodal region that's why now in the red line there is a spectral wave loss and spectral wave gain because of you do not have those electron failures now so that is uh, for that reason you have decrement now you break the cooper pairs electrons are now available so you lost the spectral wave now you gain it okay so you have that. And so basically, this is nodal antinodal. Nee, but if you're doing a measurement, your x axis is exactly the same. Yeah, your... let's see. The x axis should, should be the same, right? So, so what is the temperature at which you've done this? So basically, the red line is uh, 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 taken at 10 Kelvin deep in the superconducting phase, oh. and the black lines right above the superconducting phase, that means deep in the pseudo gap phase. Right. Yeah. Okay. Same, same. Yeah, same. Same temperature. Same is nodal and antinodal. But there are finite really in the moment. How they are accessible? Yeah. Look, there are. So there is, there is a funny surface, right? Yes. Now these electrons will be will be having vertical transition. So whatever Q they have, they are at finite Q sitting in, but the change will be in vertical direction. There is no overall change. That's all. So basically, now I, I, I'll just end here. That by looking at this energy scale, you can find out the uh, energy gap, the two delta gap. And two delta gap is eight times KBTC from the experiment. And from BCS theory, what do you expect? It's about 3.5. So definitely tells that the Q-Fred is not BCS theory. So that's kind of potential Raman scattering has from three different forms, phonons, magnons, and also electrons. And I should add the more rationalized excitations that are coming up. With this, I'd like to thank them. <laughs> okay, so uh, thank you, uh, sir. But like, uh, in the interest of time, we will not take questions right now. I'm so sorry. Uh, we'll go for a photo session uh, on the ground floor. After that, we have a quick tea break. So during tea break, you are all encouraged to interact and ask your questions. <laughs> So basically here you know, we are just measuring these green points. Okay. And here we are measuring the red point yeah. that means but that, that's because you are Measuring at some different angle? No, or measuring at the same angle, angle, but the polarization combination is different. different. Oh, okay. One is at uh, 45 degrees to degree proper oxygen. Oh, okay, okay. Cross so basically, it's only crystals of B axis along the line here. Uh -huh. Or it's only crystals of B axis along the line here. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so that's it. Yeah. 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 Okay, उट और उसका रेजिस्टेंस एकदम बहुत स्ट्रेंज है और हमने सोचा की चलो इसका रमन करके देखते हैं तो हमें ऐसे 
जिस रेंज में लोगों ने रिपोर्ट किया उसके अलावा एक बहुत हाई वैल्यू ऑफ ओमेगा पे कुछ पीक्स दिखे तो मैं सवाने क्या है एक बार डिस्कस कर लेते हैं दिमाग लगाने से
Did you get access to the server? Yes. 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 Yes.
Nice to be uh, in Trivandrum in Kerala, and uh, yeah, it's a very beautiful campus. Uh, but I still have to explore. Uh, so today, uh, what I plan to do is uh, uh, to present to you this uh, technique of density functional theory. Uh, as I mean, density functional theory as a technique uh, to solve this quantum anybody problem. So what you can do with it, what you cannot do with it, and how how far you can go. Um, when you uh, would like to model uh, real materials. And uh, this talk is uh, intended for um, final year BSc or um, MSc students. So the experts in the, um, uh, in the room uh, can excuse me. Okay, so let's move on then. This is the outline. First, I'll give a brief introduction of density functional theory. And then 
and the next uh, part uh, i will um, discuss what are the parameters that you can derive from density functional theory which can be further used for a uh, matrix modeling and then part three will be um, i'll give uh, this example from the real material and uh, there i will talk uh, in detail about this uh, colossal magnetic magnetites uh, as an example um, for this uh, uh, for the use of density function okay so um, let's start then uh, so this uh, this Hamiltonian, I think you have already seen. Uh, Professor Vidya uh, Dhiraja was uh, shown, uh, showing this uh, uh, grand Hamiltonian. So, this is the uh, full quantum anybody Hamiltonian that uh, one would ideally like to solve. So, here we have um, this is first term is the kinetic energy for the nuclei, the, uh, where, which are placed at this capital Ri with mass Mi. And then second one is the kinetic energy for um, electrons. Then you have electron um, nuclear interaction, and then you have electron electron interaction and nuclear nuclear uh, interaction. So this is the uh, full Hamiltonian, and uh, one would uh, ideally like to solve this, uh, but solving this uh, is out of question um, because uh, it's not possible. I mean, this because we have in a solid. We have 10 power 23 number of particles, so and they are electromagnetically uh, uh, interacting with each other. So, so, large number of interacting particles are there, so it's um, out of question to solve this uh, Hamiltonian. So, now what we have to do is we have to do some approximations. Okay, so the first level of approximation that is done is um, this Born Oppenheimer approximation, where um, uh, it's uh, the nuclei. Because they are heavy, uh, they are uh, frozen, they are considered to be frozen, and uh, where, where they are. And so we have the electrons, uh, which are the only players in this many body problem. Okay. So, with this approximation, uh, what we have now is we can drop the first term, which is the kinetic energy of the nuclei, because uh, they are frozen, and also the last term turns out, turns out to be a constant, so we can also drop that. And we are left with three terms basically, these three. And uh, so these are uh, this uh, kinetic energy of electrons, uh, and then you have potential energy due to electron electron Coulomb interaction, and then the potential energy of the electrons in the presence of nuclei. Okay, so this we call external potential because these two terms. Uh, are explicitly for the electron system. So this, uh, these are these are concerned um, uh, to the electron system, but this is external to the electron. Uh, this many many electron problem. This we call external potential, um, which is the um, which is due to the presence of nuclei. So these are the three terms that we are left with. And still, it is far too difficult to solve. So uh, we need further approximation to make. Uh, so the next level of approximation, generally this um, one can do Hartree-Fock approximation, which uh, you uh, all probably have learned in your condensed matter uh, course. Uh, and uh, and there is another uh, approximation, which is this density functional theory, which is uh, more modern and it's a state-of-the-art state technique which is used now um, for. Um, to study the uh, very, to study ground state properties of various materials, and we will discuss uh, this density function theory. Okay, and this density function theory is based on two theorems uh, given by Weinberg and uh, Kohn. And uh, these two gentlemen actually gave this uh, two theorems. So one is here uh, C Weinberg and what a Kohn. Uh, so the first theorem says. That there is a one to one correspondence between ground state density, uh, rho of r, of a many electron system, and the external potential. So, there, there is a one to one correspondence between these two. And this implies that this external potential uh, and hence the total energy uh, can be written as a unique functional of the ground state density. So, this is the first theorem. And the second theorem says, the electron density that minimizes the total energy functional is the correct ground state electron density. Okay, so these two theorems basically 
uh, make our life much more simpler. So what it tells us is that as far as ground state uh, properties are concerned, density contains um, uh, as much information as the wave function. So we, uh, I mean, we can escape from evaluating the many particle wave function, which is a um, a function of three and special coordinates, and if we uh, we can rather um, evaluate the electron density, which is which has only three special coordinates. So the life becomes much much simpler uh, if uh, we can um, do with the density itself I mean, rather than uh, going to the wave function. Okay, so. Um, so this um, density functional theory, now this, this, these two theorems are, are, have to be implemented uh, as, practical, uh, as a practical tool. So and this uh, scheme was given by Kuhn and Sam. Uh, so we start with this uh, Hamiltonian, uh, this kinetic energy of electrons. This is the electron electron Coulomb interaction, and then we have electron nucleus uh, Coulomb interaction. So these are the three terms that we have. Now, because of the first theorem, we can um, write the expectation value of the Hamiltonian with respect to the ground state uh, wave function, um, which is equal to your uh, total energy. So this total energy can be written as a unit functional of this uh, um, electron density. And this, uh, this uh, term can be, we can uh, separate it out in four different parts. First, uh, what we do is uh, this T0 is the non interacting electron, um, non interacting electrons, um, the kinetic energy of the non interacting electrons. And this is the uh, Hartree uh, potential. And this is the external potential that uh, was there. And now, um, what we further say is that there is one term, Vxc, which is uh, called exchange correlation function. And what is that? It's basically uh, so you have, um, suppose you, you are able to solve the um, this Hamiltonian exactly, so the exact solution, um, the energy for the exact solution and the energy for the non-interacting uh, solution. So if you have, I mean the difference is called the correlation energy. So this is uh, basically the difference between the kinetic energy of the exact um, uh, solution and then uh, the non-interacting one. So this is called correlation and the other one um, exchange is basically the difference between the exact potential minus the Hartree part. Okay, so this is the ex exchange part and this is the correlation part. These two exchange and correlation is combined into this quantity called exchange correlation functional and this is what um, we need to find out what it is and I mean uh, actually this is not known and one has to uh, do some approximation here. Okay. So once you are able to write it down this way then uh, the corresponding Hamiltonian is called cohn sum Hamiltonian which has these four parts and as you can see this is the um, non-interactive kinetic energy, um, non-interactive electron kinetic energy and then you have the Hapchi potential then this exchange correlation and this um, nuclear part. And this part is actually uh, approximated um, because we do not know what it is uh, exactly. So when we do hartree fock theory, in hartree fock theory the exchange part is exactly dealt with but the correlation is not there. Here both exchange and correlation are dealt with approximately. And this exchange correlation uh, functional um, is approximated and there are various approximations uh, that are used uh, to uh, approximate this exchange correlation uh, functional. Um, two popular ones are, one is uh, this local density approximation and the second one is uh, this generalized gradient approximation. These are uh, most um, uh, popularly used but there are many other uh, exchange correlation functional, hybrid functional which actually takes uh, part of BFT uh, and then, I mean, part of uh, Hartree Fock when you it. And uh, so, uh, so there are various exchange correlation functional that are used um, to um, uh, construct this uh, coal sum Hamilton. Okay, so, so once we have this coal uh, sum uh, Hamiltonian, then we can solve this uh, coal sum equation rather than Schrodinger equation, we can solve this coal sum equation, which are now. 
so one thing um, here you would, uh, I would like you to note is that what here what we are doing is that we are basically um, putting this non-interacting electron gas um, into two external potentials, one due to nuclei and another due to exchange correlation. Okay, so we have got, so this way we basically reduce the many uh, particle problem into a single particle problem of solving this cone sum equation. So now if you, if you can solve this um, cone sum equation and uh, find these phi's, then you can calculate the density. Okay, and, um, but the problem here is that this this density, I mean this Hamiltonian contains this um, this potentials V hat three one or um, exchange correlation or this external potential all all are dependent on density. Now we are looking for this um, density. So uh, if we do not know the density, we cannot construct this and then we cannot solve this equation. So this is basically a self consistency problem. First we we have to. Um, what you have to do is you have to start with the gas density. Then we, with that gas density, we add down this um, um, Hartree um, potential and exchange correlation potential, and then you can construct the Hamiltonian, this cone sum Hamiltonian, and then we solve that, and then we find this phi's, and uh, from there you can uh, calculate the density using this uh, equation, and then if it is uh, uh, if it is equal to the previous um, one, the initial one, then you um, you uh, end it there. If it, if it is not, then you go back and then put it as input again. Do the same thing. So you basically um, iterate the whole thing and finally achieve the self consistency when um, which is your ground state density. And once you have the ground state density, you can calculate various ground state properties um, of the system. So this is um, basically um, the introduction that I wanted to give uh, on uh, basic DFT and now there are various extensions of density functional theory. One natural one is the spin density functional theory which is used uh, mostly for the magnetic materials where the energy uh, is uh, not only uh, functional of density, electron density, but it is also a functional of magnetization density, which is uh, uh, basically the difference between uh, spin up uh, density and spin down density. Uh, so this is the spin density function theory. Then, then of course you have heard about all the um, correlated, strongly correlated systems. They are um, often uh, seen that if you do a dense, only density function theory, then uh, you uh, often this density functional theory predicts very um, wrong ground states. Okay, so um, to resolve that, there is this uh, DFT plus U um, method, uh, which is used where um, you, um, I mean, uh, I mean, you have this parameter U, uh, which um, uh, is actually the electron correlation, uh, which is added to it. And uh, as I um, uh, discussed, that this DFT contains already some correlation. So this this correlation and this uh, correlation has to be um, um, uh, subtracted to uh, it should not be counted um, twice. So that double counting has to be subtracted. So this is this method is used for correlated electronic system. Then so to the, I mean, using your densities, this yes. method can we also calculate like the, um, exchange coupling bonds? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that I I can. Yeah. Uh, so. Then um, for excited state properties, there is this time dependent density functional theory, TDDFT, which also um, I mean, um, can give you some uh, excited state properties. And this uh, density functional theory inputs can be used in several other numerical techniques, such as, such as um, dynamical numerical theory, Monte Carlo, Isaac dynamization, and all that. So uh, we we'll see, um, I mean, when I um, give you the example of manganite and see how this, this can be used. Okay, so now what are the various uh, parameters that you can derive from this um, density functional theory using which you can construct a model Hamiltonian which you can further uh, study. Okay, so first thing is this electronic band structure and density of states. This is, uh, these are the things that you um, get from density functional theory. Apart from that, 
you get various energy scales of the real material like crystal splitting, granular splitting. Then if you have, often we will see that um, so when we are dealing with tension metal um, compounds where, um, where we have, um, suppose um, we are dealing with D shell and D orbitals, there the uh, hopping integral, I mean the, uh, the electron uh, when it goes from one side to the other can be anisotropic, like different direction it can have different uh, overlap, um, overlap between um, the orbitals. So that uh, those kind of anisotropic hopping integrals also one can uh, calculate, one can calculate ex the magnetic exchange interaction um, and um, you can um, look at the magnetic, you can also find the ground state magnetic order, collinear or non-collinear, uh, candidate spin state and orbital ordering you can um, uh, predict. Uh, also, you can, there are these uh, topological systems where you can also calculate the surface states um, and uh, for the surface topology, then the strength of spin orbit interaction, then there are more um, uh, exchange interactions like um, which are seen in um, various non collinear magnetic uh, materials like Galasinski Moria interaction, you can find out. Then you can find out um, phonon band structure density of space and all that. So there are various um, parameters that you can calculate for a real material which you can then um, write down, uh, which you can then use in modern Hamiltonian and um, you can uh, do further calculation on that. In GFT calculation, you have to put U as an uh, input parameters. Or yeah, I mean, U. Yeah, you there is, I mean, uh, there is one technique called constant LDA, there you can calculate U or you can take it from experiment or you can use it as a variational parameter to, um, uh, I mean, uh, see where your, um, if, where you, um, I mean, the band gap or the ground state uh, property is matching, so that way you can, it's basically that is not an ab initio, but, I mean, that's kind of ad hoc parameter that is being put in there. Uh, so, but the hopping integrals are all much more. Uh, yeah, high, much, yeah. Much more hopping integrals, so you can. Um, you hopping can, integrals are much yeah. Much yeah. Hopping more integrals, exchange interactions, and uh, it's uh, all this uh, spin out uh, interaction. There is interactions, you can, and the splittings, okay. uh, all these things uh, are. So, like, at the robust. beginning, you place some value of u, you put it, and then match with the experimental results. Yeah, you can vary the u and see um, how robust it is okay. and where it is matching. Um, and all that. So, sorry, uh, how, how is one on that structure? Yeah, this one I will probably actually tomorrow I will uh, uh, give a talk where I, uh, so. Okay, so um, yeah, so this is a little bit elementary for students. Uh, like, uh, so many of these correlated electronic systems, um, uh, I mean, uh, seen in this um, yeah. tension metal compounds where we deal with, um, I mean, partially filled. D orbitals, and as you can see, that the D orbitals have this um, shape and isotropy. And when uh, you put in, in this uh, kind of crystalline environment, where whether octahedral or tetrahedral, the um, crystal field splitting can be different. And these uh, splittings, and uh, you can calculate from your um, from density functional theory the energy, uh, what is the um, energy scale here. And um, so this will be different because of these uh, different overlaps. Like uh, if you have dxy orbital, and these are the oxygen p orbitals. So here you see the overlap is minimal, whereas here it is maximum. So um, the uh, so accordingly, the splitting uh, between octahedral and tetrahedral will be different, or depending on which orbital. Um, I mean, depending on that. We, uh, uh, in this case, we have uh, Eg as a lower energy, whereas T2G is higher energy, whereas here you have uh, T2G lower energy, Eg higher energy. So this uh, splitting can be, uh, this crystal field splitting you can find out from the um, density function theory. And also the yarn teller um, uh, splitting, for example. So you have, uh, so this yarn effect, um, 
you uh, see uh, when you have a situation like you have electrons, less number of electrons, and there is orbital degeneracy um, here. And you have this, uh, these two orbitals can contain, for example, two spin up electron, but you have only one. In this kind of situation, it can be shown that the energy um, is lowered when there is a distortion like this. Uh, either this or a compression in such a way that you have one orbital goes down and this um, uh, the electron the electron goes there. So this uh, is energetically um, favorable. So this is what uh, this is what is called Young Taylor effect. So these kind of splittings you can uh, calculate and see um, how how it compares with other uh, energy scales. Okay, so this is again. Um, this is uh, the I mean, comparison between um, different energy scales, which will give you a uh, different uh, spin state, for example. Uh, suppose we consider we have a compound where Fe2 plus ion is there, so it can be in low spin state or in high spin state, depending on these um, energy scales, how they compare with each other. And you can find out uh, this, uh, this Moon's um, splitting also, you can find out. Uh, and then uh, this uh, crystal field uh, splitting also you can find out if we can uh, so the spin and valence state also uh, is possible to figure out from the density function theory calculations. Okay, so this is what um, I was talking about the anisotropic hopping integral. Uh, here you see that if you have uh, so here the different d orbitals are um, uh, there uh, along different directions, and you can see that the the overlap with this orbital and this orbital is uh, minimal, so this is um, this hopping uh, along this direction will be zero. Whereas here, you see, this is this will be more uh, overlapping. Uh, same orbital is there along this axis, so this p will be finite. So this kind of hopping integrals uh, and this anisotropic hopping integrals, you can find out their values uh, by um, I mean the, the directional dependence and their uh, values in different direction can be. Uh, found by doing density functional theory calculation. Um, and uh, of course, you have to, I mean, once you do the density functional theory calculation and you have the band structure, then you, uh, you can fit uh, this band structure with the one a functions and uh, find out the um, overlap integrals along different directions. So that way you know whether it is more um, uh, mobile in the plane and or across the plane or along certain directions more more mobile whereas the other directions is um, hopping is uh, less uh, yeah so yeah here so uh, this orbital um, so this this one and this one uh, they are um, so orthogonal to each other whereas here you see the uh, I mean, uh, so there's a symmetry reason. Yeah, symmetry reason, yeah. So here, this is this one and this one overlap more, whereas this and this uh, overlap less. Okay. The symmetric, uh, because of symmetric reason, you have um, different um, hopping along different directions. Yes. Uh, okay. So, yeah. So, yeah, various other things that you can um, calculate. Is one uh, Another thing that you can calculate is this. Um, Magnetic exchange interaction, which is uh, which can be calculated uh, from the total energy calculations for various magnetic orders, and then you map them uh, to this kind of uh, Heisenberg model, and you can calculate uh, J, this exchange interaction. You can also estimate um, the Gelsinski Moria exchange interaction or single ion anisotropy. So, this um, the parameter D here or J, all these uh, parameters you can extract from um, this total energy calculations, which you can then use in um, your model calculation. I mean, so when you say that you are calculating J as a difference of anti-magnetic energy? No, this is, yeah, I mean, this is, uh, yeah, different, actually, um, energies for anti-ferromagnetic uh, arrangement and ferromagnetic arrangement, the difference is, I mean, J is proportional to that. So what you can do is one, um, I mean, uh, calculates, takes, uh, suppose these four orders and you write down, um, I mean, you'll get um, some linear equations to write down uh, in terms of J and then you can solve them and then uh, you can find out J. So what I'm asking is that you assume that there will be some kind of ferromagnetic 
arrangement, even if the material, let's say, was actually an anti ferromagnet? I mean, what, what no, I mean, I'm saying get that ferromagnetic term. No, you make them make it ferromagnetic and also anti ferromagnetic. Uh, we calculate the total energy, so and then you can first of all you can find out uh, which one is the ground state, and then you can find out the J. So you just assume that. Yeah, you can manually uh, do that. I mean, for different uh, arrangements, you can calculate the energies, and then uh, you can write down uh, the total energy in terms of this uh, J, and then you can solve them, and then. Going to a simple question, the Heisenberg model that you're thinking about here mm -hmm. has the uh, xy terms as well. It should have a lot of quantum fluctuations, but um, the but yeah, this the, is the classical uh, Heisenberg model. So then it's an Ising. Right, yeah, I mean uh, we do not take this um, uh, here. It's not the I mean, no commutative. Uh, yeah, commutative. Uh, yeah, those. Uh, so then that's relations. essentially like uh, cheating. Yeah, you can. Okay, I think I don't know if I managed to go through this uh, example. Um, so, how much time I have? Okay, okay. okay so I wanted to give uh, this example of uh, this manganite where okay, these, uh, these uh, systems they have uh, various, I mean, almost all possible degrees of freedom there, like charge, or brittle, spin, lattice, and um, the phase diagram you can see. Uh, okay, so this, this is the phase diagram. Uh, here you see that there, there are various magnetic orders, uh, and then there is a metal similar transition, then you have orbital order um, here, and charge order, and all that. So, um, so this is a very complex system uh, where you see that the spin order of the magnetic order is coupled to the orbital order also. Here you see, if you uh, look at this, um, this uh, phase, you see that the C-type um, antiferromagnetic order is actually coupled to this dz square orbital order. Whereas here, you see this A-type uh, magnetic order is coupled to this dx square minus y square type orbital order. So if you have so this orbital um, order, can um, orbital order actually happens purely um, at higher temperature and then it drives the uh, spin order. Okay, so here you see if you have x square minus y square type of orbital, then the overlap in the plane is much more than along z axis. So in the plane it becomes ferromagnetic, along z axis it is um, anti ferromagnetic. Whereas here the dz square orbitals, they are, uh, the overlap is more along c axis, whereas uh, our overlap is less in the av plane. So it is anti ferromagnetic in the av plane and um, uh, perpendicular to uh, av plane it is. Um, Ferromagnetic. So, this kind of uh, coupled uh, spin and orbital orders are seen, and more exotic orders like uh, this C phase uh, is also seen in manganites at um, half copy. Okay, so um, this is the same thing. Now, um, yeah, so one can calculate the uh, as I was saying, that you can calculate the uh, energies of various magnetic state and you can see which one is where. Okay, so these energy scales you can find out and you can see that this uh, for this system the antiferromagnetic D type um, order is the ground state. Whereas here you see that if you take cubic phase, then you get a ferromagnetic metallic ground state. Whereas if you see if you take orthorhombic phase, you get the A type antiferromagnetic insulatory state. So um, you have to consider the gentler distortion and you have to consider this orthorhombic phase so that you get to the right um, antiferromagnetic uh, order, the ground state order. Okay? And uh, you can uh, find out what are the different energy scales. Okay, and so this is the band structure. Here you can see that the at the just below the Fermi level, you have this dz square orbital um, has more contribution. So uh, this information also you get from the band structure calculation, and um, so um, so when you do a model, then you can um, consider only d j square orbital. Rather than taking both the orbitals, you can only consider d j square orbital here because this is what is occupied. The other one is not occupied. Okay, and other things that you get from uh, other information that you get from um, the uh, electronic structure calculation is the what kind of hybridization it has, 
Like for example, um, if you see this LDA plus EU calculation, you see that the uh, T2G orbitals and the oxidants, um, uh, oxidant P orbital, uh, there is very little hybridization between the two. And so these things you can consider when you model, write down a model. Okay. So, so basically you find out uh, where is your Fermi level and what are the, or, I mean, uh, different, um, uh, or where the different um, uh, energy levels are, like where the T2G orbitals are, where the oxygen levels are, oxygen levels are. And so, so you can consider the T2G uh, electron because it is much below the Fermi level, almost 3, uh, 2 EV below Fermi level, you can consider them as localized. Okay. And you can treat them also classically. Whereas this EG electron, you have to treat quantum mechanically because it is uh, at the uh, formula. Okay, so these are the various things and uh, so various energy scales, you can find out first of all bandwidth, which will give you uh, information about what are the kinetic energies of the electrons are. Then you can calculate uh, the magnitude of uh, this exchange interaction, Moon's coupling, and then uh, this uh, Dantelas splitting, tau transfer, and you and all that. So various energy scales you can find out from the um, from the density functional theory calculation, which you can then use. Okay. Okay. Uh, so so here uh, the in the manganites, the basic model that explains this uh, magneto resistance is the double exchange model. Uh, where you have two terms, one first one is the kinetic energy term, um, which uh, um, which is um, which gives you the hopping of electron from one side to the other, and second one is the coupling between the uh, this EG spin and the P2G spin. Okay, so this is the double exchange model, which you can explain the magneto resistance. Okay, uh, that means uh, if you have uh, so if you have ferromagnetic arrangement, this one can go here, and then this one can go here. But if you have antiferromagnetic arrangement here, suppose these three are antiparallel to these three, then this one won't be able to go because of it will be prohibited by Pauli exclusion principle. So if you have a um, paramagnetic insulator, then once you make it uh, by applying magnetic field, when you make it um, ferromagnetic, it, it immediately becomes metallic. So the resistivity goes down uh, a lot. So that gives you the explanation of the um, this um, magneto resistance, or actually, but um, so this, but this model is not enough, and one has to really uh, consider various other things. So this is this last slide. So of course, one has to consider the anisotropic hopping um, here uh, to address the orbital order and reduce dimensionality. I mean, if you have, I suppose. Um, orbitals is uh, orders in such a way that in one um, uh, in every plane the electrons are more mobile, but in across the plane they are less mobile. In that case, uh, the dimensionality also will be reduced. And then, um, so you have um, the phase diagram is actually not symmetric around the um, uh, x equal to 0.5. So that um, that also uh, you have to address. Uh, so. On the, I mean, if you work at electron dope side, your physics may be different than uh, the whole uh, dope side. And all this, if you take into account, then you have uh, you have to have an Hamiltonian, which is uh, like uh, the first term will look like this, where you have anisotropic hopping uh, between different orbitals uh, at uh, neighboring sides, and then you have uh, uh, this uh, moon coupling uh, between this uh, T2G and EG electron, and then you can have also. Um, super exchange, anti ferromagnetic super exchange, and then um, other uh, terms also one has to uh, take care. So, this uh, can be the full model which uh, for the uh, magnetized. Okay. So, various, um, so here the various parameters you can extract from um, the FT calculation. Okay. So, I think um, I will stop here and thank you. Questions for the audience? So, uh, I had a general question. So, yes. this uh, connects to the Bonhoeffer uh, approximation. Mm. 
that is done. Mm -hmm. So like in the morning we saw that in liquid helium, uh, you have this new quantum phenomena, right? Mm -hmm. So can DFT be used to simulate, let's say, the zero point motion of the nucleus? nucleus? That I, I don't think so. So something like that won't be possible in this scheme. Uh, I don't think so. Thanks. I think two particle quantum fluctuations mm -hmm. of the two particle origin. Right. Particles are interacting. Yeah, it's not clear to me. Unless you can get the exact correlation function, the XC. Mm -hmm. If you can get it exactly, then of course the those theorems tell you that you got it. But as soon as you start approximating. Most of the two particle content yeah. will become mm -hmm. symmetry of the symmetry breaking type. Uh, there's very little room to, to, to really capture the, you know, all the possibilities of quantum fluctuations. So, another way of saying it is one could capture some crystallization, but not this condensation. So the best I guess you can really hope to get out are the hopping integrals and, yeah, and some feel for the you know all these other things that Tulika saw on. If I mean you know if they tell you that uh, if the code you know tells you that a Hun's coupling is likely to be very strong, mm -hmm. then you can start with the thing given out from the code as some starting value. Yeah, so this is the first step where you uh, you can identify the relevant energy scales. Okay. I mean, you cannot take everything. So if something is very small, you don't need to take it. Take it. Uh, so suppose U is very large, J is very large. So, so then you take them and you uh, discard the others. And you can also because uh, you don't have to always uh, do the full quantum mechanical theory for the whole entire thing. You can treat part part of it classically also, depending on where they are below the Fermi level, I mean, these uh, levels are, so. Another thing to ask, for mm -hmm. the system, which are already made with non color transfer, mm -hmm. so will they always be shown this compared to the or it is not necessary? Uh, like if you know? have uh, the antelope, uh, I mean, distortion, okay. Uh, so, um, Distortion, if you have, then um, it's not necessary that they have to have an orbital order. But um, and most often, I think it uh, has some kind of uh, uh, orbital order. But uh, I mean, in long range, it will happen or not. I mean, that is uh, separate issue. If it's the dominant coupling, then yeah. it probably will. Yeah, yeah. But if it's sub dominant, then it's not clear. Yeah. But if it is the most relevant and important energy scale, then it could well mediate. Uh, the most dominant energy scale. Yeah. Then it could well lead to orbital mm. yeah. Any other question? From the back? Mm -hmm. I have one. Mm -hmm. So, this is the magnetite. Is there more insulation? Yes, yeah, it's yeah. 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 mm -hmm. yeah, some of it becomes metallic. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, I mean, like the paramagnetic state, right? It's an state. So, what sort of insulator? Yeah, it's just that they, uh, the mod mod issues get confused with the magnetic ordering issues. Mm -hmm. So it's not uh, like in B203 and all, where you mm -hmm. can sort of tease apart the issue and say, no, here you have a truly not covered type insulator. Mm -hmm. Here, it, the screen ordering issues tend to dominate the discussion. So it's not clear to me to what extent LAMNO3 is likely to also have charge ordering of some kind, but because the screen order also rides along mm -hmm. very strongly, Therefore, the mod, mod if you look at the condition, right? Yeah. It's very sharp, you go to paramagnetic, then it suddenly drops to But you see, the, the, the issue is that the mod Hubbard phenomenon, strictly speaking, does not need any spin on it. Mm -hmm. It needs charges to localize. Mm -hmm. But in these materials, because the you know, para to antiferro anti or para to I mean. ferro happens, at the same time, it's not clear, like Raja and some others are also saying, who is, what is the chicken and what's the egg? I mean, and who, what is the cause, what's the effect? You don't really always know. 
So that's why I don't, I'm not sure anyone really knows whether this is a prototypical Mott Hubbard insulator. It could be, but it also has a strong uh, magnetic ordering. Up. This parent compound, LM103, is, uh, is antiferromagnet. Antiferromagnet. And, um, yeah, I mean, so. The already degrees of freedom are very strong. LM103 side, you have uh, MN3 plus there. Mm -hmm. So, that is, uh, of course, a strong gentle let. Um, yeah, so on that side. Very and that is so, yeah. so on the other side, if you uh, start from calcium side, suppose C M N O three, there there is a degeneracy. Uh, I mean, so whether you uh, dope hole or whether you dope electron, so uh, this Zandler, um effect can be in one case can be relevant, in another case may not be that relevant. Suppose you start from calcium and then um, I mean, so C M N O three side. Mm -hmm. There you have MN4 um, plus, right? So you have only three electrons, these T2G electrons. In EG, EGs are, there is no electron. So they're uh, double degenerate, okay? And then what you do is you uh, dope that with electron. If you put this uh, in the electron in the degenerate, uh, double degenerate uh, level, okay? Then um, that, uh, there you can actually, the antler effect will, may not be that relevant, but on the on this side, when you start from LM and O3, uh, you have a strong antler uh, effect. So, the calcium so, side also, it will so better to insert that understand the electron doping. Uh, electron doping, uh, the, I mean, the, what happens, calcium dope side, there are different kinds of antiferromagnetic arrangement that happens, okay, with doping, actually. So, uh, suppose at the end it is G type, then it becomes C, then it becomes A, like this. And then uh, finally, at x equal to 0.5, I think uh, around that is uh, it becomes very uh, minor. Yeah. When you do the structural relaxation using DFT, mm -hmm. uh, you basically find the ground state energies, then you find the derivatives with respect to the atomic movements, mm -hmm. and then you use the thermal right? mm -hmm. to calculate the forces and yeah. then relax the structure. Mm -hmm. So, doesn't, it, doesn't the final Parameters, the structural parameters, don't they depend on the exchange correlation approximation that is implied? Yeah, that, that can, that, that, that's, yeah. I mean, like if you um, do DGA, mm -hmm. you um, you can land up somewhere, um, mm -hmm. right? If you do LDA, you can land up, I mean. So these exchange correlation functions also can be, you can, you can see where which fits better the experiment. Okay, okay. so suppose when you you can do it with the different extent correlation functional huh. and um, do the structural relaxation and then you see where which one gives better fit to the experiment. I see. So uh, yeah, then so you choose that. the uh, extent correlation function. Okay. I have a question. That uh, J company constant is an E effect minus E A effect. It's relatively proportional to energy for the market yeah. structure. Mm -hmm. uh, Mm -hmm. So how is that No, it's actually, um, it's not that simple. I mean, you have to, uh, I mean, it's just, um, I mean, J, if you take just two spins, then it's basically the difference between triplet and uh, singlet state, right? Energy difference um, between that. Okay, so that sense, uh, you, can, um, you can say that, I mean, suppose you have a, a full G type antiferromagnet and ferromagnet, then you have uh, the difference can also give you the uh, J. So you can understand it, uh, yeah, like if you consider only two spins, then it's like J is this exchange is basically the difference between uh, singlet and triplet energies. So that way it's like antiferromagnet and ferromagnet. Let's have the speaker. Uh, let's welcome our next speaker, Professor Anil Shaji. Uh, he's uh, working on quantum information and science in the Department of Physics at the uh, So his topic for today is entanglement in non-classical correlations in structure or uh, structured multiparticle systems. Let's welcome him. All right. So remember, it's kind of late. So I will keep it brief. So, uh, 
So uh, I just want to uh, just uh, sort of introduce this like three different perspectives that uh, quantum information theory and related topics use on condensed matter physics. I am by no means an expert in condensed matter physics. Uh, uh, but uh, let's see. Let's all see how it goes. Uh, right. So of course quantum information theory gives, brings together ideas from information theory and quantum mechanics together. Therefore, uh, some of the questions that were raised before things like what is entanglement, what is superposition, what does it do, what, what use is it, what can you do with it, they find a different kind of approach to those questions. You can find a different kind of approach to that question in quantum information theory because uh, I mean quantum information processing and nowadays it has morphed into what is called quantum technologies uh, because one takes an operational view of these quantities and tries to use them to do stuff, rather than trying to use them to just to understand what is happening in say materials or condensed matter and so on. One tries to directly manipulate these resources, these phenomena like a superposition or entanglement and things like that, uh, to do various things. Okay, so what it gives you is a slightly different perspective on these uh, 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 quantities and, prop and their possible role in say understanding the way nature works also. So, and uh, so that's part of the uh, mandate of why, why we cause together, uh, led by uh, to uh, bring all these people together to see if there is a sort of say, a certain synergy that comes out of uh, thinking about the same problem in two different or uh, multiple different ways. Right. Um, so, so this last part, uh, which talks about uh, once you have, once you understand these quantum phenomena or quantum properties, and can even think about how to manipulate superposition and entanglement, etc., as uh, say a little bit more precisely how uh, to, to, to talk about more uh, new and esoteric states of matter that could be potentially created. Right. So, moving on. So, let's start at the very simple thing uh, because uh, uh, we talked about entanglement and all that, uh, uh, and, the, and multi particle entanglement, then into the 23 particle entanglement and all that. Uh, but uh, 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 in my uh, teach, my, my uh, professor's view, my teacher's, my PhD advisor's view, there is nothing except quantum superposition. Because entanglement is the superposition of multi-particle states. It's because you decide that th this state you are considering is of multiple particles that you get into all kinds of loops in your head as to what it means and what it uh, 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 implies. So, superposition is, of course, uh, just a statement that comes way back from von Neumann on the fateful day. He decided that uh, all quantum states are uh, vectors in the Hilbert space. So, instead, he called it a vector space. Then you are done because in vector space, uh, if you have any two vectors, then any combination of those two vectors is also another vector. And if you say that states are vectors in Hilbert space, that's a very strong statement because if you can construct a vector in that space, then there should be a state of the real physical system that corresponds to that. So that backward thing is the one that is complicated. Okay, you may not be able to see that state or construct that state easily in the lab, but it must exist because that is the consequence of the uh, postulates of, one, uh, of quantum mechanics. Right? So unless the postulates are wrong, such a state, such states will be there. And that came into all kinds of trouble because you can think of it in the following way, which I am kind of keeping it very simple. Uh, to lead up to certain other discussions, but uh, for example, if you're taking a material particle, the particle being located at this location x1 is a state that you are all comfortable with, right? Uh, the guy sitting there is a state that is everybody is comfortable with, right? For whatever reason. Right? But then uh, this state is also something that you are comfortable with. That is, you are maybe sitting on this side. That's also fine. But the problem is that at the instant you admit that these are possible states of your physical system, then arbitrary superposition of this is also a necessarily available state of the system. Something that if you work hard enough, if you try hard enough, you can find the person in two places at the same time. As HODC kind of has to do that nowadays. <laughs> it is a logical consequence of the statement that 
you have states or vectors in Hilbert space. Because I just added the two vectors and constructed a new vector, which has to be an element of the vector space. Well, I mean, I just said that these are just vectors which form a set, then this problem will not be there, right? Because the problem is that it's just vector space. Therefore, all these other guys are also there. So that leads us to the notion that, of course, confuses and pounds a lot of people. How can things be at two places at the same time? What does it mean? The question that it doesn't really mean really anything, it's a consequence of the of what we know about quantum mechanics, which is basically uh, uh, supported by hundreds of years of experience and still ongoing experience. There is no really denying that. Right? So, uh, of course, uh, another connected issue is that if you ask the particle where you are, you will get an answer. And that answer is usually, usually something that is comfortable to you because you are the one asking the question. Right? You are normally not inclined to ask the question, are you at two places at the same time? Rather, you'll ask, are you here or are you there? And if you ask that question, the quantum particle will answer either I am there or here with a certain probability, which we all know how to compute, which stops, uh, given the superposition state. Right? So, an, a, a, in the case of spin systems, as we have talked about, uh, a quantum spin, a spin half system, can have two well-recognized states, one in which the spin is pointing up, one in which spin is point down, but those are not at all very special states of the system. They are the states that you are comfortable with talking about. Because the bulk majority of states of this, available states of the system are the ones that are a superposition of spin up and spin down, which would answer I am spin up with probability alpha square and I would, have, I would answer spin down with probability beta square provided you ask me the question, are you spin up or not? You can always ask me the question, are you spin up plus spin down by root 2? Then you will ask, answer that question with a certain different problem. These are all things that can be a learning for the mechanics. But one of the uh, 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 lessons that it teaches you in the context of quantum information theory and quantum computing particularly is what my most of advisors used to kind of say and many others also do say that Hilbert space is a very large space. It is much, much larger than you can possibly comprehend from classical intuition. Because the statement is that if I take two spin half systems, or in the language of quantum information theory, two qubits, and consider the state space of that, then it is consisting of all possible states that are of this kind, which are a superposition of four distinct states which I can label properly, which we call basis states or which we call comfortable state for them. Now, this is in contrast to the case of two classical spins of this type, which can take up or down values, in which the state space is what is called a direct sum. If there are four possibilities, but here it is not just that there are four possibilities, there are four possibilities and all possible superpositions of all four of those possibilities with all these coefficients. And notice there is a, a little bit twist in the tail here already. Which is that at this point, suppose you want to ask the spins what state you are in, right? You are not constrained really to ask whether uh, both spins are up or down. You can ask the first guy, are you up or down? You can ask the second guy, are you up plus down or up minus down or any other superposition, right? Unlike two classical coins, which also have two states, right? Also, two coins you will get head, head, tail, tail, head, tail, tail, head. The only thing you can look is whether each coin is heads or tails. There is no other possibility. Right? So already you are deviating from the given the notion of like what kind of classical behavior can show up. The classical life behavior can show up when you make a measurement because the measurement is going to determine what is going to show up. Right? So um Right. So, and finally, the uh, so uh, so one of the key take by uh, or takeaway points of this is that if you take a collection of quantum particles, right, and just let it be in any state you want, with probability overwhelmingly close to one. The state that it is going to sit in is going to be one that is not, does not have a classical element. 
because the set of classical light states in which every particle is having a definite spin state, for example, if you are taking collection of n spins, a, the classical light states in which each particle is having a definite spin is mathematically a set of measure 0 in the state space. So almost always it's going to sit in a state which is not only a superposition state, because it's a superposition state of multiple particles, it's also an entangled state. So even when you talk about quantum materials, quantum machine materials and entanglement may be the reason for it being quantum and all that. From the other direction, what you realize is that from the quantum information theory or quant basic quantum mechanics direction, what you realize is that almost all states in which the system may be found are typically entangled. So entanglement is not really the esoteric strange thing, right? It is the norm. It is the one that is always there. The trick is that, right, can you hold an entangled state, an esoteric entangled state in place or can the system hold it in place? long enough for you or, or, or stably enough for you to actually make measurements. What people talked about measurements or, or, or take the so-called thermodynamic limit where you can measure certain quantities, certain macroscopic quantities which show behavior that is indicative of the fact that the underlying status is having entanglement. So that's where really the quantumness of quantum Particles of, of, of quantum condensed matter uh, really should uh, would start showing up. Just becoming being quantum, just having entanglement is not in this perspective not something of a great thing. It's there always. With a one small caveat, I would add, and that comes from the fact that uh, we've seen spontaneously symmetry broken ground states right. so so often that classicality has ruled condensed matter, right? And, and our intuition in condensed matter is so strong that most condensed matter physicists are not able to comprehend what you're saying, that the quantum states are the more natural states. Yes. They're not esoteric. Yes. It's just that all the experiments that you do typically show up the so-called classical states, which are, I agree with you, in significantly fewer number. Yes. Which is why this perception of esoteric ah, has right. come about. That is where there are, there are now very other interesting ideas that are showing up in quantum information theory also. Which is about asking the question, given a quantum state, right, what makes it start behaving like a classical? And then the answer is not very clear. Right? What is it that makes it behave as a classical state or a classical light state? And what do I mean by a classical light state? What I mean really by a classical style light state in this context is that I have a collection of particles in which each particle can be assigned a particular state. What one guy is doing is not dependent on the other guy in any strange or quantum way. Okay, it can be dependent on what the other guy is doing in a very classical way, like classically correlated systems. But there are no quantum correlations in that sense. So part of the answer uh, that is kind of coming in the context of very small uh, quantum systems is that it is those states which have an ability to imprint the fact that they exist onto other systems around it. Those are the states that are most likely to be found. Okay, that's sort of the what's called quantum Darwinism. Okay, so what it is saying, I will digressing a little bit just to uh, uh, respond to what Siddharth was saying. It's very true, right? If you let your environment and the measurement apparatus and your experimentalists okay, who are all kind of nuisance into the picture, they will end up disturbing typically the system in such a way that the system decides to sit in a classical like state. Okay, They would prefer to sit in a classical like state and there are ways of avoiding that. Okay, The simplest way of avoiding that is what people do is to say that you take your sample, stick it in a dilution refrigerator. 
So it avoids not only the extreme end lift, but it also avoids the thermal hormones and everything else. Right? So they're inside that box and you start behaving quantum mechanically. You start seeing some of the esoteric features emerging out of that, which is to be expected. Okay, but that's a different story altogether. I don't want to go into that. So, for instance, like when you're saying that this comes up in the form of like the whole stuff is anyways quantum, and then I mean, no, the question is how. That non classicality of it, okay. What would make it stable? What would make it remain? Okay, what would make it observable? So basically, let me rephrase my question. So, suppose we are sitting at a critical point, so to say, right. like either classical temperature induced or quantum, I don't know, whatever something induced, and you are seeing divergences of quantities, you know. So, how do you how how what how do you make a sense of this that you know a spin sitting at zero site is really very strongly affected by a spin which is sitting at I don't know very long okay. distance and, and so, the movement of this has a big effect on that. So why okay. would you say that it is? So that is actually this slide, oh. right? See, one of the the lessons you learn from mixing information theory with quantum physics is the fact that if you think about it in terms in, in, the, in terms of information or information content, then entanglement is not exactly such a strange beast after all. Because what one is saying, this is that quantum information has this strange property that it can actually lie delocalized across multiple physical systems. Now, if you think about it, it's a very strange thing, right? What it's saying is, see, classical information, so one of the tenets of information theory is that information requires a physical realization, okay? So, what does that mean? That means that if I have to communicate or even carry information with me, with me there has to be a certain physical uh, manifestation in the current context of this room full of people if at all any information is being transferred from me to you it is being transferred through sound waves so sound or pressure waves becomes the physical manifestation or at least the information is the modulations in sound literally is the information flow from me to you okay so uh, but the thing is that so a consequence of that is that if you want to manipulate information, right, which is sitting on physical entities, the manipulation of information sitting on physical entities are governed by the laws of physics that govern the entities themselves. Because you cannot manipulate information in a way that violates the laws of physics that is governing the object on which the information is sitting, right, because you cannot violate those laws. So quantum information theory is the notion where we are assuming we are taking the view that information is residing on quantum objects. Therefore, its dynamics, not only the dynamics of the particles, but the dynamics of the information itself can be governed by the laws of loss of quantum mechanics. Mix that with superposition, we come to the conclusion that information itself can lie delocalized across multiple quantum systems. So this is the prototypical example that people have talked about before. The so called bell state or singlet state or triplet state and so on, states of this kind. What it is saying is that, and uh, 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 Siddharth uh, uh, mentioned this in the morning, if you look at one of these guys and ask what state are you in, it will tell you that I am in the completely mixed state. The information theoretic point of view of the completely mixed state is that it is that state which contains no information. Okay, because you are asking this pen whether you are spin up or spin down and what's the answer it is telling you it is telling you that with probability half i am spin up and with probability half i am spin down therefore it is revealing to you nothing about which preference it has as far as spin is concerned it is absolutely unbiased with respect to that right so it contains no information about what spin state it is likely to be in because it's not really committing to anything not even slightly it's a completely mixed state. But on the other hand, this is a very definite state of two spins. 
You know exactly what it is. There is no, nothing left to know about it. But the fact that it is in this state, the fact information is inaccessible if you are allowed to talk to each of these pins individually. Because each of these pins individually are in the completely mixed state, which reveals nothing about what state it is. Instead, for each, any one of these four states, if I look at the individual spin state, it will be this. So it doesn't even tell which one it is. Right? So you, you, so in that sense, the, in, from the information uh, theory point of view, all the, you are led to the conclusion that all information content of the state is actually lying between these two spins, across these two spins, or in both spin, two spins at the same time. Okay, just like the superposed state that we talk for talked about in the beginning, which is here and there at the same time. If at all you talk about information content, it's there delocalized. Or the information about these entities, they have decided to, in our modern terminology, they have decided to upload it into the cloud. So it's sitting there in the cloud. It's up in the air. It's up in the air, right, basically. Can, so in this context, entanglement is essentially tantamount to having delocalized information. A kind of delocalization of information which is only available in the case of quantum systems. The classical systems, classical bits can never do this. Each bit will have its own value. You can look at it independent of the other. They may be correlated. That's one thing. Okay, But still, each of them can be interrogated on their own and they will answer the very definitely I am either on state or off state, if you are talking about transistors. This can never happen. Okay. So the existence of delocalized information therefore essentially becomes and amount to having entanglement. Now expand this to many systems, many particles. Right? If the information about the state of the system can be completely uploaded into this collective cloud, then you have an entanglement state. The problem is that such information is very fragile. It will leak off into the environment, into the measuring system, into the observer, whatever. So keeping it there is the trick of the game. So if you can keep it there in a stable ground state of a quantum system, then that system, that multiparticle system is bound to exhibit signatures of the fact that it is highly intact or strongly correlated or whatever it is that various terms that are being used in the context of condensed matter physics. Right. So, um, yeah. so let's moving on. So this is yeah. the like, uh, So we had this four states and we said that if I interrogate one of them, I can't tell them apart. Yes. But suppose they had different energies for some reason. In the sense that the even as long as even if it is time dependent, okay, as long as the time dependence is limited to the individual spins, in the sense that the Hamiltonians are local, right? Then no. Then no. There, yeah, of course. If you are putting a common interaction on top of it, yes, you can distinguish between, but. Uh, that is not necessarily true because they only have two states, right? Because they will equally say that I am here or there. Because you are only changing the relative probabilities of finding one of these four. Maybe the singlet is preferred over the triplet or the other way around. But it doesn't matter where you are, the individual guy doesn't know. Yeah. So, so, some time dependent version of this that matrix on Well, strictly speaking, for any local interaction, this has no time dependent. Right? This is an identity matrix. You multiply it with any unit rate, nothing will happen. You, you know you diagram, nothing will happen. You just sit there. So locally you cannot do that. A global transformation that will convert this into say a classical light state, like 1, 1, or 0, 0, that can reveal which one of these four it is. Because it will preferentially take this to 1, 1 and this remains these three remain, say, for example, entangled. Then you will say, okay, if I can get each 
by this interaction get A and B to commit to being one and one. Then I started from this thing. Things like that. Right. So this is a very common example in this context, which becomes kind of uh, uh, easy to manage. Right? This is of course frustrated system. Uh, Unfortunately, for the remiss man, it's not because he's an expert in frustration. Um, no, we are all experts in frustration. <laughs> <laughs> More frustrated than us. <laughs> but the point is that, uh, uh, right, so when you talk about frustrated systems, again, what are we talking about? You're saying that, okay, you have got spin up down possibilities, spins with two possibilities on a square lattice. Uh, with anti ferromagnetic kind of coupling, they find a way of arranging themselves so that each of them can decide which state they are in. There is no ambiguity. They have a choice which minimizes energy without losing their own identities. Right? But when you have put it on a triangular lattice, the point is that okay, if you decide that these two guys are one is up, one is down, the third guy has a choice to do. The third person cannot be opposite of both of them. So you say that the third guy is frustrated. Because the third guy is frustrated, this guy is also frustrated, and so on. They are all frustrated. Okay, but that's true from a classical point of view. Right? Because if you allow superpositions and if you allow entanglement, there is a very natural resolution to this problem. Because entanglement, as we just saw in the case of two qubit example, allows all these guys not to commit to being any of either up or down. Right? So the structure, the geometric structure of the lattice in this case, from, along with equal interactions, equal uh, distances, etc., promotes a scenario wherein an entangled state or in a state in which the information about the, the state of each individual spin has been uploaded into the cloud, it promotes the existence or presence of such a state. And that's why you look for esoteric quantum behavior in such so-called frustrated systems as a first cut. Because that is where you will naturally expect that the resolution to this problem is sort of delivered to you on a pattern by quantum mechanics. Classically, you cannot resolve it. And again, when you look at it, what happens? If you actually measure the spins, it will come to some configuration. It will decide on something. Uh, uh, but really what's happening, if you don't look at it, what you have is there are several possible ground states with more or less the same energy that is allowed under this configuration. And then from a quantum information theory point of view, you would say that the most natural state of the system is in one in which it is actually in a superposition of all these possible ground states, which in turn is in general as likely to be, most likely to be an entangled state. So that way you would expect that this is what would happen. Yeah. It's not true that you cannot write entangled state as a sum of the linear combination of... Forms. You can always write it as a sum of things, but the problem is the sum. You cannot write it as a product. Entangled state as a linear combination of right? No, you can write it as a sum, you cannot write it as a product. If it's a product, mm -hmm. then that means that each spin has a definite state. Right. But if it's a sum of products, then, then, what, it, then it, what it means is that spin of one is dependent on what the other guy is doing. Because it's up, up, plus down, down, means that first one is up if the second one is up, and vice versa. And it's down if the other one is up. If it's just up, up, and the first one is up, second one is up. It's a product. Or it could be up plus down into up plus down. That's also fine. Right? That's also problem. Yeah. I would like to emphasize here that tied in with this is again the notion of symmetries. Yes. Because when the system is truly choosing this tensor product, this linear superposition, it is doing so manifestly in agreement with the symmetries of, let's say, some Hamiltonian that could be governing the yes. dynamics. There, the <laughs> symmetries are, are violated. Typically, when, when you choose one of those classical states, which happen to be non-entangled, right. then, then certain symmetries of the Hamiltonian are manifestly broken. 
we call it spontaneous, whatever you want. But those some symmetries are violated. Whereas typically here, in, in this in this example of frustrated system. So there I would slightly disagree with this. This is a confusion that I'm also having. Right. For example, suppose I flip every spin. Yes. That's also a ground state. Right? But then you kind of hide behind translational symmetries and all that. But literally speaking, in any finite system, if I flip all of the spins, that's actually a different ground state. With the exact same result. So I would actually expect the system to be in a superposition of those two states in general. It turns out, so there is a resolution to this. Sorry. sorry. There is a resolution provided you measure anyone. If you fix anyone, everything else makes sense. Huh. Right? So then the spontaneous symmetry breaking that you talk about essentially becomes a manifestation of the fact that there are stuff around it. Huh. Right? Which are possibly interrogating one of the states. Because if you... If you flip, if you consider the state in which every spin is reversed, every red one becomes blue, blue one becomes red, it's exactly also a ground state of this system. So, so Philip Anderson offered a resolution to this puzzle. I don't want to give you the technical details, we can discuss that later. But what he said is that the cat state you're talking about, which is this guy, plus that other fellow, where everyone is flipped, yes. that cat state it's uh, very unstable. It's extremely unstable. Yes. It's because infinitely unstable. Because it's interrogating a single spin can collapse. That's right. right? While here yeah. interrogating a single single spin will not collapse. I know. So there's a robustness here. Yeah. Given by that's right. Sorry. Which is happening as a consequence of coherence or decoherence of the environment, you're saying. Here the coherence of one of them will collapse the entire. Correct, correct. So here this is the fixation of one is happening because of that decoherence. Yeah. Or one or many, it doesn't matter. But it's, it's very easy to collapse. It's it's it's, it's very fragile. The square lattice, yeah. whereas the other lattice, the triangular lattice, it's like our Karu market through ground space, right? That's the just one. some right. straight field will choose one. So so will choose, choose one, and you are either here or you are there. That's right. so that's the, of course. So there is no protection there. Correct. Here, the the geometrical frustration lends a protection. Yeah. yeah, and so that's why sometimes we will call it topological protection and so on. Because what is happening is that Knowing one of the spins or even doing some mischief with it does not affect the others. Does it's not affect the collapse. information in the cloud. Yeah. It just stays there a little bit more robust. Okay. So so that's what people talk about long range order, topological protection, uh, or even the notion of uh, what is called fluctu strong fluctuations. These are all really that because fluctuations. Is what fluctuations are things that drive between one configuration to the other, one between this to this to this to this, right? But the thing is that the actual state is a superposition of all of them. Therefore, fluctuations. But therefore, the manifestation of that only at beyond at or below the critical points of this, right? No, in this case, there is no that sense, right? Okay, critical point in the other sense that when you talk about, I guess, uh, see here, it's just geometry. There's nothing else. I'm just saying it's all equal, all symmetric, all nice. Right. No, I mean, you know the square lattice, you put in diagonal interactions, right. you can again add some robustness yeah. to the system. You can. Why if you're choosing only IZ space? No, no, that is for an illustrative case. This can be now extended to much more three dimensional lattices uh, or, or, or more complicated spins. Then we will not have several states. There will be 120 degree adding phase. Yeah. That is the yeah, but then on the other hand, when you talk about SZ, SZ, you are really talking about icing kind of strings, right? Because you are talking about component of them. We are okay. defining some quantization axis. Yes. Or... If you do that. So, um, right. So, I'm not saying that it is easy to generate such a scenario in a real life. It's because a lot of realistic considerations have to go. Right, but the point is that to understand what why you are looking for quantum behavior in frustrated systems is not exactly hard to understand because there in actually there quantum mechanics offers a unique resolution to the problem of deciding the, uh, the frustration in not being able to decide what state I should be in because it allows the particles to be in a in all the states at the same time in a sense okay or all uh, states which are such that the
the state of one is dependent on the other and the superposition of such things. So now, just to make things a little bit more interesting, I will deviate from there. And so, of course, um, when you talk about uh, uh, delocalized information, you immediately start talking about how do you detect that. And that detection obviously comes in the form of detecting correlations. Correlations that could otherwise not be there in the case of classical uh, 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 systems. Right. So, and so this goes into this entire story of what uh, was there again. Others talked about the models, talking about their correlation functions. Correlation functions becomes important, and how their behavior can signify non trivial behavior in, in, uh, in large, uh, in material systems and so on. Okay. Uh, so, but what we have done just to get a flavor of that, we ask this separate question. Right? Okay. I have said that. Really, if I look at one or two of the spins, it doesn't really tell me anything about the global state. But can it state actually tell you something about whether the global state, the state of all the particles together, the state of that content system is entangled or not, or entangled in a certain way or not? So this was a question that was asked in a totally different context. It was in the context of trying to understand uh, 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 how certain kinds of quantum computing devices work. So I'll just give a brief glimpse of that. And it turns out that in quantum mechanics, entanglement is not the end of the story as far as strange kind of correlations are concerned. There are correlations that is not entanglement, not classical either. So the only word you can call them is, is non-classical correlations. That's the best word. It's not entanglement. It is not classical correlation either. It's something in between. This has been known for a while. So let's examine how we quantify that. This is just a, uh, to set the stage for just flashing some of the results. Uh, we do this quickly. Because one way of uh, quantifying correlation, say, these are two classical systems, a coin and a dice. Suppose they are correlated. Right? One way of quantifying correlation between them is using what are called entropic methods. Okay. What is the entropy of a random variable? It can be in information theoretic point of view. Entropy of a random variable is a measure of how much we don't know about that. It is a measure of your ignorance about the random variable. Say x is a coin. If you don't know, when, you, when it's flying through the air, you don't know what state it's going to end up in. Therefore, your ignorance about the coin is characterized by the entropy, in this case Shannon entropy, which is given by minus of half log half minus half log half pi log minus pi log pi probabilities for etc. But if you know, for example, that it is already a bias coin, you are some kind of crooked bookie who has used the bias coin, then your entropy is slightly less because you don't ascribe the probabilities as half half because you know that with probability two third is going to show up x. So then your entropy or ignorance about the coin is less. So I am denoting the ignorance by the circle and the size of the circle denotes the how much ignorant you are. So kind of be uh, ignorant about the coin. Now this red circle is your ignorance about the that. Okay. But if they are correlated, these two ignorances do overlap with each other. Right? So, your total ignorance about the coin and the die is given by the envelope of this blue and red circles. That's your total ignorance. And what is this thing? Right? It is the resultant ignorance of Y provided you know X. Because if you learn about X, what happens? This circle collapses to zero. Because you know everything about it, so your size of ignorance drops to zero. And in doing so, if your initial configuration was like that, it will take out this slice of H of R. So your remaining ignorance is about Y is less. So this is the case where they are correlated. If they are uncorrelated, these two circles are separate. So if one collapses, nothing happens to them. So this little piece here, this, um, so this red piece is given at ignorance of Y given X. Okay, And this little piece here, I guess I label it here, which is where I 
This is what's called the mutual information shared between X and Y. It is that information that is lying across X and Y. Okay. It is how much you know about Y given X and Y versa. So that's called the mutual information or, or between the two random variables X and Y. Okay. So this is a classical snap. And you can say that okay, H of X, this uh, uh, ML up, size of this ML up has to be at least as big as the bigger one of these things. Okay, when is it as big as bigger one and the other one is completely inside? Okay. So that's easy to see job. But when you talk about the quantum systems and you compute the analog of the entropy, which is called the one line entropy for the two quantum systems, you will find a strange scenario like what we discussed in the case of single life, where you could actually know everything about the you could actually know everything about the two spins but nothing about the individual spins so unlike the classical case where the envelope was at least as big as each of the two big circles you can have the case where the joint entropy which is really the envelope can actually be zero when each of these two guys are Fine. That's how you would quantify quantum correlation. So in that sense, right, the mutual information can take two different forms. Okay, one that depends on whether you measure one of the systems or not, and the other that is not dependent on that. Let's not worry about the details. But the point is that classically. These two expressions for the mutual information, which I have called J and I, have to be equal to each other. Classically, they have to be the same. But quantum mechanically, because of the reasons I said before, where the overall envelope can go to zero when the individual pieces remain, it turns out that these two guys need not be the same. Okay. So after some picking through it, uh, one would realize that this quantity that I call I. It's a measure of all the correlations between the two systems. While the one that is called J is a measure of all the classical correlations between the two quantum systems. So if I take the difference of I minus J, entire correlations minus the classical ones, what remains is has to be recognized as quantum correlations. Okay? Total minus classical, if there is something there, then that has to be recognized as quantum correlations. And it turns out for a quantum system, this is fine. And this quantity is called quantum discord and all that, but that's not very really important. Uh, so, and it turns out that for non-entangled states, this is a manifestly non-entangled state, you'll find that the quantum discord can be fine. So it is correlated in a way such that that is not allowed for two classical spins. But it's not entangled either. It's somewhere in between. So to uh, take uh, to tell the long story short, what with the, uh, I guess, work done with Vijay and uh, Patak and Chandran Mato and others, what we found out is that, uh, okay, I'll talk about the details later. Uh, we'll just jump to the conclusions part, right? If I consider very structured systems like spins on a lattice, it turns out that there is a connection between global entanglement in the lattice of spins and local quantum discord. Don't worry about the details of this graph. What it tells you is that there is a signature of multi-particle entanglement that could possibly be extracted by looking at individual sites. We take two of the sites and compute these non-classical correlations and found them to be non-zero. That is actually an indication of the fact that the entire lattice of spins is entangled together in a genuine multi-partite. So details of that we will discuss later. This is sort of the message of this paper. Okay. And this is has led to some very strange experiments also. Right? There is a, there was a recent report uh, a year back or a sunny year back where they uh, claimed that they managed to take a superconducting qubit and entangle it with a tardigrade. A tardigrade is a very small microscopic animal. 
So they manage, they said that they claim that one has entangled a quantum bit with a frozen tardigrade and they also claim that after unfreezing it, it lived again. Okay. So, but where does the signature of this entanglement come from? How does this, this how do you detect that? Okay. Because the de detection is that you cannot go measure on the target. What do you mean measure I mean, right, on the target? You have to actually look at the other parts of the system, which is the qubit and various other little pieces that go into that experiment and compute things like this, non-classical correlations. And show that the existence of such correlations indicate that there is a globally entangled scenario. So I put this out here because in the context of condensed matter system, this provides an alternate way rather than possibly looking at thermodynamic quantities to, signify, to, to indicate entanglement, would it be possible to consider microscopic measurements on small parts of the systems and whether of that system and see whether that will signify that whether the properties of the state of that subsystem can actually capture the fact that you can have a entangled global state of the system. Whether this can be seen in the context of models or actual experiments, those are different questions. And we try it for other kinds of lattices and so on. It kind of comes and they, they are all connected. It's much more stronger, this signatures and so on. This is just randomly generating and seeing a connection between entanglement and this one. Okay, so we'll kind of stop there because already people are really tired. Uh, but uh, I just wanted to give a slightly different picture or direction from which one can address the questions, some of these questions in the context of quantum materials. And and, uh, and maybe suggest that there may be other ways of trying to detect quantumness in a uh, uh, in a condensed system or a critical system and or, or whatever one is really okay thank you for your attention Okay, the stage is open for questions. Anyone? Too bad. Well, we've already also asked you a lot. Good, that, that's right. The last no, the last slide. This one? The thank you slide. Thank you. Thank you. It's more yeah, nice. So, where are we sitting here? Oh, to be here. We are sitting right here. And not everybody. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And we are localized there. Yeah, this is my office in the back. Right now, the director is kind of. Could you be. Eventually, he will probably get this. Yes. Yeah. I'm periodically here and there. <laughs> Oh, that is a, a parameter that characterizes the connection, and there is something significant about theta equal to pi by two, which is more important for the context of quantum computing than this scenario. That's why this whole thing collapses with theta equal to pi, which is something totally different from which I'm not going to hold. But what is gotten here is the quantum discord between two of these. As a function of theta, which is characterized in this link. Any two connections? Why? Any two, all of them are very good. You take any two and look at the non classical correlations, you will find that almost always the non classical correlation is very high. Provided the global state is fully connected, fully entangled. And these five that are going to be that's the number of such nodes. Right. So can one construct a measure of the global entanglement? Yes, global entanglement is actually, we had put that slide there, but as long as the global state is pure, there are some nowadays useful measures of entanglement. This, this, what we use to compute is what's called the generalized geometric measure, which can be computed in many of these lattice systems because it turns out to be just a calculation on just one of the members of the lattice. Uh, finally, 
because it turns out that we, we take this um, global state and do all possible split decomposition and the largest Schmidt coefficient is this, this thing. But it's this guy. Yeah, but it turns out that largest Schmidt coefficient always appears if you just take a one qubit subsystem and find its eigenvalues for the most part. Huh? You just look at one of those yeah. guys huh. and find the dense, reduced density matrix and its largest eigenvalue. Huh. That will be almost always equal to this this measure in pure states. If there are exceptions to it, but in many cases, that calculation is that easy. And you're saying that's because of this connection between this guy and uh, uh, the discords? No, not discords. That, not, no, lattices are correct, but seeing that right. this quantity is calculatable for many lattices right, right. Yeah. because of this property. Okay. Uh, so that is very useful for them. Okay. For certain other complicated lattices, it may not work. You have to do uh, maximization over all kinds of sub density matrices and all that. So it's very hard. But lattices with certain symmetries, it turns out that okay, you look at the reduced state of one of the spins, okay. and that will give you this number. Oh. So it's as simple as that. Wow. That itself is. It's in a very obscure part of one paper that we have to dig out. This was actually a result. By the deal with the Sir, actually, I have a general question. Uh, since you uh, talked about uh, geometric prescription and interaction, uh, we have like in finite matter system, there are uh, systems which have high, highly geometrically frustrated and uh, high uh, interaction, like uh, for example. Uh, morning man was talking about uh, strong empty threads and CS other server was talking about the like uh, some some other systems uh, like they have high uh, interactions and they have they are strongly correlated and they have like if if we are saying that since they are uh, strongly correlated they will have they are like a spin liquid like one D liquid or other kind of liquids and why community is not seeing in that way, because uh, everyone is trying to probe a single qubit and to measure the entanglement and to make it couple each other and to so, such kind of uh, things. Not like uh, like in condensed matter system, uh, exploring entanglement in the uh, this kind of uh, condensed matter system. Like why no, exactly? first of all, condensed matter systems are rarely so clean and neat, right? Because around your system there are all kinds of other things. There are impurities, defects, imperfections, all that. So you can never get as clean a system as, say, in atomic physics or something like that, right? So you in this more insulator state, you can people study it by simulating it with atoms because it's so clean. Right? So, so you have to start once you start understanding the effects of all these external uh, influences and start accounting for them, you will start seeing where the interesting quantum behavior is and where it is not. So you have to do things like make cleaner samples, make good crystals, cool it down, all kinds of stuff. Too. Yeah, that's why I'm asking. Like for example, the like strontium cuprate, they have some 2000 Kelvin in, uh, interaction uh, energy values. And uh, since they have such high energy values and they are like uh, only liquid it, it forms a only liquids and uh, we are not seeing the entanglement in such systems but we are trying to probe in building one qubit and uh, one, like one by one qubit and two no no we are not that part is not second we are not trying to probe entanglement building one qubit and all that that's an effort to actually control the environment uh, the entanglement it's not about study the environment we know exactly what kind of entanglement you can it's about controllably creating it and manipulating. Why do you want to do that? You do want to do that. I mentioned it in the line here. Is that if you can do that, you can simulate these complicated condensed matter or chemical or chem uh, molecular systems on an array of quantum bits that you can compute. Compute with. Okay. So there, the idea is to create a simulator or a quantum computer. A universal quantum computer which can model the properties of all this. Basically, trying to get all the 
to to get all the the people doing all this particular modeling DFT etc out of business because you can do a full calculation with a full slice quantum computer. Right? If I had 10 to the 23 controllable qubits, I can actually solve the Grand Hamiltonian exactly without any problem. Now, 10 to the 23 qubits, what is it in real terms? It's 10 to the 23 atoms. That's not the thing. It's 18 grams of water. Yeah, it's 18, 18 grams of water. water. Except that I need control over every atom. Yeah. That is where the catch is, but that's where you are trying to do. So right now we may not be able to put people out of business in the year, but trying to get there with respect to quantum chemistry. So that's a different five qubits. Hmm? Five qubits? A thousand. No, right now. Right now, thousand I gave this. I think people are doing sensible stuff with only five. It's a different. Nine ninety five is all noise. But you'll get this. <laughs> I more than 100, right? No, 1000. 1000. Let's talk about what kind of calculation we could do. Because right. Einstein may be very small. If you have 1000 noise free qubits, you can simulate the Hubbard model tomorrow. Yes. You win the Nobel Prize. Yes. And many more things. So, start with the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> if you're happy. No, but seriously. They don't. It's not yet. Five are the, the coherence. Five. I, yeah, it's not yet there, but it's getting there. No, not just decoherence, other things also. But the thing is that, okay, decoherence time being short is not such a big deal because you end up doing millions of gate operations before the decoherence time. That's not a big problem. The problem is also the numbers, connectivity, all kinds of other things. Means we should be able to give information and read out the information, and it shouldn't hamper the. Inter in that process, they will be yeah. reading out and they will be giving the information. But no, but that will necessarily do. Right? See, a quantum computer, the input and output are human readable bit strings. What the quantum computer does is that it gives you a shortcut from the question to the answer, which are all bit strings. See, what does a classical computer do? It takes a bit string, it does a manipulation, creates another bit string, then it creates another bit string. Then it creates another bit string, finally it gives you an output. Okay. But what are bit strings? Bit strings are classical like states of a quantum system. Okay. So what the quantum computer does is it takes input, takes a shortcut to the output. Where the shortcut is through states which are not bit strings, which are superposed states, non-classical states. I think that's all. Yes. Answer is always a bit string, the question is always a bit string because otherwise you don't know what it's computing and what it's giving you. So, so with this exponential scaling of resources which people talk about, I mean you have like many body system and we want to... It's the same thing, right? we are actually creating a captive n-dimensional inward space for yes, 2 to the n-dimensional inward space, in which you can do manipulations as you need. That's a quantum computer. Sir. I have two questions. First of all, you showed that square lattice in that. Uh, in that uh, Which square lattice? No, uh, the, where the, there are up and down switches only. So, uh, <laughs> is that stage perfect uh, unitarily connected to uh, the JHZ state in n dimension? Like, the, the so, it's not a JHZ state, right? No, uh, but if you all the time. The HC stage is what? Uh, uh, so the well, that's thing. a three, three qubit state, right? No, no. GHC is sort of like a Schrodinger cat state. Yes. All in one state plus a macroscopic uh, Yeah, yeah. But you so no such thing. This, this can take that opposite of that. That would be a GHC-like state. GHC-like state. So uh, you mentioned that uh, a, a slight uh, if we measure one of the qubits, it would just collapse into either one of these, yes. right? So I, it is that sensitive. Yes. So this kind of sensitivity does that uh, somehow indicate the amount of genuine entanglement in that system? <laughs> Can you say something about that? Sensitive, no, but see, entanglement works in a different way because the GHC state has what is called one unit of entanglement. Because just one of them. If you measure it goes. Okay, that's got 
It has just as much entanglement as a bell state. Nothing more, nothing less. Right? While a more generic state, which is a superposition of many, many different things, can actually be much more having quantified than it can have much higher entanglement than GHC. So GHC is not in any sense an extreme entanglement state. But, uh, it's a macroscopic superposition, so it's a kind of an unbelievable state that it could exist. That's all. Also, you mentioned of something about quantum disorder. Is it in some way connected to this uh, non-locality without any dynamics? No, no, it has nothing to do with non-locality. Right. That's a different thing. Okay. Okay. Thanks, Anil. So, I wanted to ask you about this various measures that exist in literature for witnessing multipartite entanglement and I mean at least from whatever I have found I don't see one being preferred over the other and there is no consensus on whether you know if you want to see bipartite entanglement in a system you should be using x vis-a-vis -vis y or something like is there any no, there is no specific case. I mean any measure could be a good measure for Yes, or a bipartite because the measures are all what are called entanglement monotones. So they are all monotones, which means that they have all these nice properties like yes. Right? So if you add things, uh, it satisfies various yeah, inequalities and so on and so forth. So if they all satisfy the same set of properties, so you can use any one of those. Right? It's like saying that whether I should tell measure the temperature in Fahrenheit or Celsius or Kelvin. That's fine. It's not happening that uh, a given measure is finding something more than another measure. All of them are just telling me the same information about the system. Are you saying that? The measures are. But when you talk about witnesses, it's a little bit. Yeah, more that's what for, for the witnesses. Because there is no foolproof witness for all kinds of entanglement when you have more than two qubits. Okay. 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 So the idea is that the Set of all states of a quantum system is a convex set. Okay. Within that, there is a small set which is a set of all separable non entangled sets. That's also a convex set. So you've got a convex set inside a convex set. Okay. And what, well, then something called the Hamburg theorem tells you that if you have that scenario, there is always a surface that separates the separable and entangled set. And what witness does is to but capture but as much of that surface as possible. So sometimes you will be getting a slice which touches the surface only at one point. Sometimes you may get a complicated surface which touches the actual surface at many points. But it's very difficult to actually construct an actual witness which exactly matches the surface. It's almost impossible in most scenarios. So that's why witnesses are, are not perfect. Because and sometimes we are getting this part, sometimes we are getting that part, depending on what witness we are using. Let's thank the speaker. Okay, thank you. Let us end the session for today. Uh, thank you all of you for uh, thank you. Uh, thank, thank for all the speakers as well as the audience for keeping the patience for those who are here, still here. I have a good Okay, so uh, this brings us to the end of the workshop. And I mean, in our initial plan, it was supposed to end at 5 o'clock. But uh, I'm very happy that it has gone for this while. So the, the schedule that was uh, due for uh, evening from 5 to 7, we are going to shift it to tomorrow. And I Thank everybody, all the students, volunteers, everybody who's here uh, for making this a very enjoyable. At least, I mean, I think that it was quite nice and enjoyable, and all of us have learned quite a lot. And we, I think, it has given us enough playground in which we can now start talking to each other. So, um, yeah. Uh, so these, the people who, so they are here. Okay, fine. So uh, let's uh, also give a big hand to all the volunteers who set up this session. Very, very nicely. And uh, I don't know where are the food coming.